Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Karen wants me to get rid of my home theater system. We've been together for just over a year, and up until now, things have gone without a hitch. I asked her to move in with me last week, and she was thrilled, as am I. I love her, and living alone is getting old. Over the past few days, she's been moving her stuff in, and I've given her a pretty free hand in redecorating. I'm not particular about that much around my house, and I want her to feel at home. Really, the only thing I am particular about, other than my own office, is the living room entertainment center. I am an AV hobbyist, and I put together a home theater system over the last couple of years. It's nothing crazy. 65-inch LED TV with a 2.1 sound setup, two speakers and one subwoofer. But everything is of excellent quality and perfectly maintained without a cable in sight. I'm proud of it, and I love watching movies, gaming, and having others over to enjoy it. We were relaxing on the couch after moving some more stuff, and she said that she hates how the sound system looks and wants to get rid of it. This was very confusing to me, as she's been over to my house to watch movies many times and has never mentioned a thing about them. She said that now that this is her home too, she doesn't want to look at those hideous things. The two speakers have bronze that shows on them. Fair enough, the bronze isn't to everyone's taste. I put the grills on. Nope, she still hates them. I try to show her other speakers that I may be able to replace them with. Nope, she doesn't want to see any audio gear at all, including the sub as well. And my living room only works with the entertainment center against an exterior wall, so hiding the speakers is out of the question, which is expensive as heck anyway. After a somewhat impassioned discussion, she finally compromises, I can have a sound bar. Uh, no, absolutely not going to gut the system I built just to put in something crappier in every way. I put my foot down on this issue. She's free to change just about anything else the way she likes, but I love my home theater and I'm not changing it. She's back in her old place right now, ignoring my calls. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. She wants a sound bar instead of a home theater system? Is something wrong with her ears? Am I the jerk for tricking my ex-husband into letting me adopt his son? I met my ex-husband when I was 21 in the wake of his first wife's passing. It happened while she was giving birth and I had just lost my best friend. We met at a support group. We became good friends and I became a regular part of his life. Our relationship was strictly platonic for two years. During this time, he seriously dated another woman but the relationship didn't work out. I was already a part of his family in a way, and I loved his son, Jay. A few months after the breakup, we start dating. We moved really fast, and we were married within a few months. Once we were married, with his first wife's parents' blessings, I took on a more active role with Jay. By the time he was three, I fully took on the role as his mother. He was bonded to me like he was born out of my own womb. I started feeling those mama bear instincts around him. He called me mom. Three years go by and we start having problems in our marriage. I then found out that my husband had been having a full-blown year-long affair with the ex. I found out that she had even gotten pregnant but had lost it. Their plan was to be together, but that loss led to the breakdown of their relationship. I confronted him. He accepted and asked for forgiveness. He swore that he was in a dark place and promised to be better. We slept in separate rooms for six months and finally reconciled successfully. For the last four years, our relationship has been perfect. For him, he had put the affair behind us, but I wasn't honest about my feelings. The truth was, I was biding time to make my exit plan and to get his first wife's parents to cooperate with me. I then planned a vow renewal ceremony where I officially asked my husband the permission to adopt his son. Again, my son's maternal grandparents were in on the loop. I filed for divorce the day after the adoption became official. My husband thinks I've played a long con and deceived him. I think I did my part to protect my relationship with my son. 
I had no other option but to wait a few more years to leave because I didn't want the courts or the system to create any problem with the adoption. Am I the jerk? I just want to make it clear that I have no intention of stealing his son away. We will have equal custody. I had no intention of staying in the marriage, but I lied because I didn't want to lose Jay in an eventual divorce. Edit 2. In my divorce petition, we have already stated that divorce was already in the works, and I adopted him right before I filed for divorce because I raised Jay as his mother, and I wanted to establish myself as his legal parent in the wake of the dissolution of our marriage. His maternal grandparents are also fully behind me. I'm not fighting over custody. In my petition, I've already stated that I want my husband to have equal custody, both legal and physical. Well, what do you think? Was OP wrong for what they did or not? Please let us know. My mother threw my sister a party for my eighth birthday. This happened in 1998 when I was eight years old and my sister was five. From a very early age, I knew that my younger sister was the golden child and could do no wrong in our mother's eyes. Mother Dearest was horrible towards me for most of my childhood until I was 14 and her mistreatment turned towards my sister as well. My parents had separated before my sister was born. They didn't mesh well together but tolerated each other for the sake of the kids. Part of the reason that my sister was mom's favorite child was her love for horse riding, which I was never interested in. The more hostile our mother got towards me, the less interested I got in anything she was interested in. And then came my eighth birthday. I was friends with our next door neighbor's kids and a few kids from school. Although I didn't have that many, I loved the friends I did have and was excited to share my birthday with them. My birthday was on a Friday, but mom told me that she'd arrange my birthday party for the Saturday, which was fine by me. The day of my birthday party came and I got excited. At that age, I hadn't yet had my heart crushed by my mother and her blatant favoritism and mistreatment, but that was the year I began to hate my birthday. The party was arranged to start at 12 p.m., so I wore my favorite dress and sat outside to wait for my friends to arrive. This was the point that I realized that something wasn't right. Outside was the mother of one of my sister's friends with a pony in tow. My mother knew I wasn't interested in horses, and even if I was, this horse was too small for an eight-year-old. As more guests started to arrive, my heart broke more and more. These were my sister's friends, not mine, and for the icing on the cake, out came my five-year-old sister in a Cinderella costume. None of the people were there for me. This was supposed to be my party, but instead, it became a party for my sister. None of my friends were there. All of the birthday presents were addressed to me, but were things I didn't want. My little pony toys and other horse-related gifts were what I got from my mother and the people at the party. The only present I got that wasn't horse-related was from our dad. He came later in the day to wish me a happy birthday and by that point the other guests and the pony were gone. I can remember him asking me what was wrong as I wouldn't come out of my room or talk to anyone. My mother acted dumb and said that she didn't know why I was upset. It wasn't until many years later that my dad found out what had happened. After that day, I didn't want a birthday party again. Even now at 30, I don't make a big deal out of my birthday. I still celebrate it, but I don't do birthday parties. My sister has changed a lot since then and I don't hold any grudges for the things our mother did. We don't speak to our mother anymore and our father passed in 2009 when I was 19. It's tough sometimes, but me and my sister are really close, so we have each other to lean on for support. I'd be lost if it weren't for her. Am I the jerk for not cleaning while I cook just to prove a point to my husband? I've always cleaned as I cook so that when it gets to the end of the meal, there's minimal mess. My husband is the opposite. When he cooks, it's like a bomb went off. I've encouraged him to clean as he cooks and if we're doing a big meal slash holiday meal together, I often make sure to assign him that role. Like most people, one of us cooks, the other one cleans up. I am the better cook, so I cook like 80% of the time. He gets an easy cleanup. I'm busier than usual at work, so he's had to step up. Whenever he's done, the kitchen is a mess. I don't even get how it happens. There will be oil splatters untouched, stuff drying to dishes, peels and meat. I'm not about to let food sit out overnight, so after I'm done eating, I'll start the process and won't get to really relax much. Last week, I asked if he could please try cleaning as he cooks. He told me, the rule is one person cooks, the other person cleans. I said, I get that, but you're leaving me with a huge mess every night. He said, I just don't have the time to clean up when I'm focused on cooking. Knowing full well, I'll see him scrolling on his phone. I just got so fed up. So on Sunday, I made a big pot of chili. I didn't clean up as I worked. When I was done, I served him 
sat down, enjoyed a beer and dinner. When he finally went into the kitchen, he said, What the heck? Why is there such a mess? I said that I was too busy paying attention to the chili to clean up. I started to get ready for bed. He was like, Uh, you're just going to leave this here? And I said, yes. He said he would have to wake up extra early to clean up and that he had to be at work earlier than usual and was supposed to play a game with his friends later that night. So could I just clean up? I said, no, I cooked, so he has to clean. Two days later, he's still upset with me because he ended up not being able to game and told me that he didn't get enough sleep and was exhausted at work. Not to be too snarky, but it's not like he's a surgeon because I had to prove a point to him. I told him that nothing else seemed to get his attention and I feel pretty justified. He told me I was being a smug jerk about it and it was childish. Am I the jerk or is he? Edit. A couple of people asked how we can make so many dishes. It should take 15 minutes, etc. We don't have a dishwasher. There's no room for one. So everything has to be done by hand. Additionally, doing the dishes means cleaning up the counters and stovetop and sweeping the floor, taking out the trash if need be. When I make chili, it's a process starting with dried chilies that I toast, soak, see, pulverize, etc. Then there's cooking the dried beans, then there's the onions and garlic and peels, any other veggies, seeding tomatoes, cans of tomatoes, grinding the spices, etc. Then there's grating cheese for the top, etc. It definitely left a ton of dishes and other stuff behind. Edit 2. Sorry guys, I was reading comments as I was at work. I thought this would get like 10 comments tops. So another thing that comes up is, whoever cooks also cleans. But since I cook most of the time, I just don't see that as being also fair to me. I'll end up spending almost every single day after work. I've been ending work at 6 or 7 some days lately, cooking and cleaning. If I had him cook more, I would definitely start to gain weight and then we'd have another issue altogether. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her husband? Please let us know. We need to find a way to fit a dishwasher in there somewhere. Manager does a one-off delivery and gets a hilarious review. Manager got a phone call from a takeaway customer to say he hadn't received his food. He agrees to remake and bring food out to him and gets the best review ever. Hello. On December 12th, I ordered my meal from your bird box menu via Just Eat. My order was for around 15 pounds and was due to arrive at approximately 6.20 p.m. Unfortunately, this never showed up. After around 20 or so minutes of checking the app, which was left on the status waiting for an update, I could finally see that my order had left the restaurant and was winging its way to me. Excellent, I thought. It's a little late, but it's not really an issue. We're all human, right? After the excitement of seeing the little motorcycle icon get closer and closer to my doorstep, I was very disappointed to see it disappear. OMG, I thought to myself, has he crashed? Has my Tennessee chicken burger met an earlier demise and now strewn all over the road in a sad pile looking worthy of the Turner Prize? Perhaps it was aliens. Had they finally showed their presence after all this time in the middle of sleepy Norfolk, deciding to attack the Just Eat rider whilst tucking into my cheesy ham and bacon fries? I mean, I wouldn't blame them. After all, they are delicious. After eagerly awaiting for another few moments outside in the cold darkness, I sighed and retreated to the living room. I guess the thoughts of a knight in shining armor walking up outside the house like the pizza delivery guy from Home Alone were scorned. However, I would not be beaten. I woefully contacted Just Eat where I met a friendly, unhelpful bot. The kind of bot you would put in goal at primary school football games because he owned the ball. The bot then politely informed me that the restaurant had added 56 minutes to my delivery time, followed immediately by, your order should be delivered in the next few minutes. I know, confusing, right? Perhaps I was witnessing a mirage while stalking the writer on the app. Or did this stupid illiterate jerk just give my gourmet burger to someone else and wish them a Merry Christmas? Turns out it was the latter. After being advised by the helpful bot once more, I contacted the restaurant directly via telephone. After explaining my dilemma to the waitress who had the task of taking my call, I was then put through to a chap named Manager who holds a managerial position at the restaurant. Manager is not your average Joe, or average manager for that matter. Not only was he extremely apologetic, he was also empathic, whilst carefully taking in every word of my sad Christmas tale. Manager, realizing I was in a state of terrible peril and hunger, quickly donned his cloak and cap personally delivering me a fresh piping hot meal. An act of great kindness which he did not have to do, nor should he have to compensate for. Just eats rubbish service. But he did and with great professionalism. Not all heroes wear capes. 
Thank you and Merry Christmas to your team at the workplace. Please make sure this feedback lands on the desk of at least one big cheese in a tailor-made suit. Without staff like manager, there would be no board meetings nor timeshares in Spain. Give me a raise or replace me. Almost a decade ago, I worked in a call center doing over-the-phone tech support. I worked there for almost seven years until I was fired because the desk phone they issued me malfunctioned for six weeks straight, despite my continued twice-a-week complaints. They didn't even try to appeal my unemployment either. Anyway, I started there in 2008, and by 2010, I had switched from a customer service role to a tech support role, and then moved into a more senior tech support role, which did not come with extra pay. My job consisted primarily of calling customers back who had an issue that normal tech support was unable to resolve. If I had time, I was expected to help call back customers who left dissatisfied surveys as well. I was also given certain blocks of time during the week to monitor the interdepartmental chat room to help answer questions. I also had a lot of documentation to do to keep track of everything I did and said to a customer. I take pride in my work. Once I learned the ins and outs of the system, I became rather competitive. Each survey or escalation had an associated ticket. We were expected to close 60 tickets per month per person. This equated to just under three per day. In order to close a ticket, we either had to resolve their issue or at least note their additional survey feedback, escalate their issue to the corporate office, to die, more on that later, or leave three voicemails over three days and send them an email. Once I was comfortable with what I was doing, my goal became not to close the most tickets, but to absolutely destroy everyone else and how many I got done. The minimum was 60 per month, and there were a couple of people in our 12-person department who never broke 100 and were normally doing 50 to 70 a month. Most people were in the 100 to 200 range, a few sometimes getting up to 250. I regularly did 400 or more every month for almost three years. I had days where I would make 75 phone calls a day. I also monitored the chat room, often more often than required, wrote articles for our internal database, helped our slowest members with paperwork, answered incoming frontline emails if they were behind, and had low-level agents directly transfer live customers to me rather than escalating them if I knew I could resolve their issues right away. Towards the end of that three years, I also began helping out another department that dealt with customers who mailed their device in for repair. It wasn't that I was so much smarter than everyone or ridiculously good at troubleshooting, I'm just organized and driven. When we had a slow month where almost nobody called us at all, I only did 125 tickets and read probably seven hours a day. I read Stephen King's Dark Tower series in a week, entirely at work. The company I worked for, the one who signed my paychecks, was a contract company owned by a big multinational out of Canada. They took contracts from companies like DirecTV, Comcast, and USAA. I found out the company I was doing contracted work for paid my company $35 an hour for my time, but I only saw 1050 of that. I also was almost never allowed overtime maybe one to two weeks a year for the entire seven years. First level leaders were salaried out, and if they didn't work any overtime, made about $12.70. I heard that the next level leader made about $60,000 a year, and the building director doubled that. The company that made the product I was troubleshooting was like a dumpster fire. They sold a product that developed a hardware issue, which they knew was a hardware issue, but they forbid us from telling a customer that, and instead told them that we were working on a software update. Despite being primarily in the USA, our website only offered user manuals in Spanish and the website developer claimed that it was impossible to add a new tab for user manuals to the website. A coworker recoded the website, posting new pages on a personal server and linking every outside link, like to another part of the website, in just 45 minutes and presented it to our corporate office. Our warranty only allowed for repair. We would not ship out a replacement device and would not provide any sort of loaner device. Minimum repair time was three weeks and the customer was responsible for shipping the device in, including paying for shipping and a box. If it got lost on the way, it wasn't our problem. Apparently, our repair center decided that first in, first out wasn't a convenient system for processing the repairs, so they just pulled however they felt like it. I had the pleasure of calling customers who had mailed their devices in over a year prior because it wouldn't even power on to tell them that it was now out of warranty and we no longer had any parts to repair it anyway and would they like for us to mail it back to them. Now comes the malicious compliance. The first came in when the company tried to launch an in-house made data backup service. It was extremely poorly developed and failed miserably. 
Much better and free systems existed, and even if the company's system had worked flawlessly, it had no benefits that I could see. When we started receiving complaints that it was not working, our corporate office told us to just immediately escalate to them. Don't even troubleshoot. I knew nothing was ever going to come of that, of letting cases just trickle in. I knew that corporate would just let them die. So I came in one day and I took all of the pending cases for issues with the backup service and entered them into the ticket service program. Now this is where it got really good. At the time when you created a ticket, it would send you three emails by the time you had finished. That's before leaving notes or closing it, just entering information. I knew this and I knew I could change the responsible person on the ticket from myself to the person at corporate in charge of this issue at the beginning instead of assigning it to them at the end. I entered 128 tickets for that issue alone that night. I was working second shift at the time. It only took me a few hours. I had plenty of time to do real work after that. That means the person at corporate who was supposed to handle these cases came into work the next day with over 350 new emails in their inbox. When I got to work the following day, I was told we were no longer escalating those issues and instead just telling customers that we were working on fixing it. Those customers never got called back and the person at corporate later lost their job because they barely ever got anything done. My last malicious compliance came when they started letting people work from home. They did this to save on operating costs as they expanded the workforce. By moving associates to work from home, this was 2012, they didn't have to pay for electricity or as much bandwidth, etc. If you worked from home, you were issued a terminal and keyboard slash mouse and a phone. You had to supply a monitor and the system was a virtual machine. When an opportunity came up to switch to work from home, I put in for it. They moved people in groups as they purchased new equipment. When they found out that I wanted to work from home, they tried to talk me out of it because I wouldn't be able to do escalations and surveys at home. I would have to be frontline tech support again. I asked if I could have a raise then. I was already topped out and I knew I would never get a raise ever. They said no, so I chose to work from home. My main reason for working from home was actually money. I didn't get a pay cut and I was spending a lot of money on gas because I lived 25 miles from work and gas was over $4 a gallon at the time. Working from home was like 50 cents an hour raise because I was spending $20 a week on gas. Working from home was also great for me because I could work in my pajamas and didn't waste over an hour driving to and from work. I never understood why they wouldn't let me do what I had been doing before from home. I had all the same tools at home as in the call center. When I left my old apartment to work from home, I was doing at least 25% of the work for the entire department. I was closing 400 and 500 tickets a month and still wasting an hour or two every day. They ended up needing to move three people into the department to replace me. I stayed with the company for three years after that, mostly because the work was easy and I wasn't particularly motivated to find something better. I ended up getting fired in the end. Like I said, they issued me a desk phone. It was like a landline phone, but had an LCD screen with some configurable options on it and you could plug in a headset and it worked over the internet. About six weeks before I got fired, my phone started having an issue where it would drop calls. Normally it would ring and you would press answer, but it started having an issue where it would ring once or half a ring or sometimes nothing at all and then hang up on the customer. Sometimes it would then place me in a state where I couldn't take calls again until I pressed a button on the phone. I notified my supervisor immediately when it first happened and continued to do so twice a week over the next two weeks. Despite my repeated complaints, I was told to just watch it and she refused to send me out a replacement. A week before I was fired, I was working on a day when my supervisor was not. A different supervisor saw that I was in this unavailable state and despite me telling him that it was my desk phone and that it had been happening for weeks, insisted on giving me a formal verbal warning. When my supervisor came in the next day, she immediately called me and told me she was upgrading my verbal warning to a final written warning. The company, like many, had a four-step system of a verbal, written, final written warning and then termination. She gave no reason for why she was upgrading it to a final written. A few days later, I noticed that one of my tools was not working correctly but managed to struggle through until lunchtime when I restarted my terminal. After lunch, when I restarted, I was unable to log back in. I immediately texted my boss. We had to clock out for lunch. I didn't want to be in more trouble and I didn't want to be underpaid either. I then called our help desk but I was back on second shift so it was after hours support and they were unable to help me. It was a Friday night and they said that normal help desk personnel wouldn't be available until Monday morning. I hung up and called my boss instead. It went to voicemail. I continued to try to reach out to my boss Saturday, Sunday and Monday via text, phone and email. 
I had been scheduled to work all weekend. I normally had days off in the middle of the week, but couldn't do so as I was unable to log into my terminal or phone. Monday morning, I called the help desk again and was told that I wasn't part of the company anymore, but there was no reason listed as to why. My boss finally reached out to me on Wednesday via text and said that I had been fired for call avoidance. I filed for unemployment. It was denied, but when I appealed, the company didn't even have someone call into the phone interview, so I won by default. I was on unemployment for six weeks before starting at my current job. Since then, I've gotten two promotions and am currently making more than double what I made at my old job. To top it all off, last year the company lost a class action lawsuit for making people sign into their terminals and open software before clocking in. They didn't want to pay people for those five or so minutes a day and they lost millions of dollars. I got a check for a few hundred bucks out of it, which was a nice touch. Karen tries to use my mother to get free breakfast. Cast. We've got Karen, awful entitled nosy woman. We've got Karen's daughter, not entitled at all. We've got my mom, we've got my dad, we've got me, we've got the manager, and we've got the waitress. Me and my parents like to go out to have breakfast every Sunday, and on this particular day, we were in one of our favorite restaurants, located in a mall, without suspecting what was going to happen. My mom ordered a club sandwich, and just before she took the first bite, she noticed something was out of place. Among the salad was a blue wire, the kind that is wrapped in plastic and used in bread bags to keep them closed. She quickly called our waitress and explained the situation in a very discreet way. The waitress apologized, took the plate away, offered to bring her a free courtesy dish, and said she would talk to the manager. Thinking back, maybe the word free was what made Karen notice us. Right next to our table was a woman, Karen, and her daughter. When the waitress went away, Karen suddenly began to talk to us. Karen, that was awful. They should have been more careful. You could have choked if you had eaten that. Mom, joking, good thing I noticed before I started eating. Yes, maybe the cooking staff should have paid more attention while serving, but we weren't particularly angry about it. Mistakes happen, and Sunday morning is always a busy time at that place. And as my mother said, no one got hurt, so we just let it slide. Karen, on the other hand, proceeded to complain as if the wire had been on her plate instead of my mom's. She told us about this time someone she knew, friend, sister, I don't remember, found a nail in their plate at another restaurant and sued the place. Doubt it was true. I felt like she was trying to impress us. My parents were acting polite, just playing along, probably thinking Karen was just a concerned woman. I was silent for the most part of it, wishing she would just shut up, while I noticed that her daughter was silent as well and that she had this expression of absolute misery on her face. Now that I think about it, it was a signal that Karen usually displayed that behavior quite often. The manager finally came and, because of the fuss Karen was making, thought she was the one who had the problem and apologized to her. The waitress corrected him and then he talked to my mother. Manager, we are very sorry. Please feel free to order whatever you want, free of cost. Mom, I'd like to have another club sandwich, please. Karen, no, you should order something more expensive. They committed a mistake. You deserve it. Karen's daughter, quietly. Mom, please stop. Mom, getting mad at Karen. A club sandwich is fine, thanks. The waitress and the manager retired. We thought that was all, but we were wrong. Karen still complained about what had happened and, in a not so quiet or discreet manner, basically said that my mother was stupid for not taking an opportunity when provided. Karen, if it had been me, I would have sued this place for endangering my life. Karen's daughter, slightly raising her voice. Mom, please just stop. That didn't even happen to you. Eventually, the waitress came back with my mom's sandwich. And at that point, my dad and I were angry and wanted to tell Karen to stop with her complaining and bad mouthing. But my mom insisted we ignore her and tried to enjoy our breakfast the best we could. Karen and her daughter finished eating and finally went away. We sighed with relief thought that this was over and we would have some peace, but no, again we were wrong. Waitress to my father, shyly, excuse me sir, could you come with me please? Dad, is there something wrong? We just need to clear a misunderstanding. Dad, if this is because of my wife's incident, there's no problem from our part. We understand it was an accident, do not worry. Waitress, looking extremely embarrassed, yes, it is because of that. There's this woman at the cashier claiming to be her sister 
and requesting a null bill for herself in your behalf. My dad practically stormed out. My mom asked me to follow him and so I did, just in time to see Karen yelling at the cashier, a young woman, and the manager trying to calm the situation. Karen, my sister and I have agreed to sue this place because of your irresponsibility. You put a piece of wire in her plate and still want me to pay for my meal? Dad, that's enough. You've been disrespectful to my wife and the ladies, the waitress and the cashier. You are the worst kind of person and are in no way related to us. Stop lying and pay your bill already. My dad is the kind of person who rarely gets angry, and when he does, he gets extremely serious. So I was really surprised to see him like that. I want to clarify that he isn't a violent person, but I had never seen him yelling at someone like that before. I also noticed that Karen's daughter was crying right behind Karen, talking on her cell phone, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for her, because honestly, she did nothing wrong and her only fault was having Karen as a mother, something that she couldn't have chosen. Looking back, I wish I had approached to tell her I knew none of this was her fault, that I noticed she tried to calm her mother and we didn't blame her for anything. Meanwhile, another waiter arrived with the mall's security. They made sure Karen paid her bill, then escorted her outside, with her poor daughter following from afar. The manager apologized again and because of the incident with Karen canceled our bill. Despite this, my parents and I agreed to leave half of our total bill as a tip because the staff was in no way responsible for our bad experience and they suffered from it too. Still, I doubt we will return to the same restaurant out of embarrassment. Have you ever found anything strange in your food? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Anytime I find something in my food, I sue the place, even if I'm the one who put it there. Karen mother-in-law demands a key to my house. My wife and I recently moved into a new house because my wife wanted to be closer to her parents. I agreed as long as we had an understanding that this didn't mean they would just be stopping over unannounced and that we still had to maintain boundaries with them. We found a house about 30 minutes from where my in-laws live and I figured that would give us enough of a buffer so that they would have to let us know whenever they wanted to stop by. My wife completely agreed to this before we moved. A couple of weeks after we moved in, my wife texted me while I was at work to tell me that her mom wanted to drop off some items for our kids at the house. I told her I was unable to leave work to let her in, but reminded her that we had hidden a spare key in case of emergencies and that we should tell her mom where it is. Mother-in-law found the key and got in, but I was already kind of frustrated that mother-in-law wasn't respecting our boundaries, but I figured I could always hide the key in a different spot later so that mother-in-law wouldn't keep using it. So that's what I did. I hid the key in a different location and showed my wife where it was in case she ever needed it. Not even two weeks later, my mother-in-law texted me while I was at work, saying that she was at our house again and couldn't find the spare key. I told her that I had moved it and that she would have to wait until either my wife or I come home for us to let her in. She kept texting me and trying to call me, but I didn't answer her calls and texted her that I was at work and was unable to help her. When I got home that night, my wife was upset with me that I wouldn't tell mother-in-law where the spare key was and tried to convince me that we should just give them a key so that it wouldn't be a hassle. I told her I didn't want them to have a key because mother-in-law has already proven she doesn't respect our boundaries. I also reminded my wife that she had agreed to all of this when we moved and that I was getting frustrated that both her and mother-in-law seemed to be disregarding my feelings on this so quickly after we moved in. I told her that the spare key was for emergencies, not for mother-in-law to use whenever she decided she wants to come to our house. My wife got kind of huffy and said that I was purposely trying to push her family away. I told her that I was trying to maintain boundaries that we had both agreed on. She had started making passive-aggressive comments to me about asking my permission to have her parents over. I told her this was exactly the kind of situation I was worried about before we moved and her behavior is starting to make me regret agreeing to it. I told her that I agreed to move closer for her and all I ask is that she respects some very simple boundaries but she's acting like a child about it. Both her and mother-in-law now think I'm being a jerk but I think they are steamrolling boundaries and hoping that I will cave. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his wife? Please let us know. If I still had a mother, she'd be over here all the time. Thank God you don't, Karen. Thank God you don't. I recruited an unwitting army to annoy a jerk. Back in the early 90s, my friend, I'll call him Lou because that's his name, was selling his RX-7 via an ad in the old print Auto Trader. It came out every Thursday, 
so that first weekend was critical for sales. The very first guy that came to see it on Saturday said he wanted to buy it after driving it. Of course, he had to finance, so they couldn't finish the sale during the weekend. Lou was worried about losing all the bites from the new ad, so he asked for a deposit of $500. The guy wrote a check. Lou told the rest of the callers that weekend that it was sold and, unfortunately, didn't ask for their numbers in case it fell through. This story predates caller ID availability in my area by a couple of years, so these leads were gone. As you surely expect by now, the guy flakes on Monday and Lou deposits the check. Payment stopped. Big surprise. Sitting around my apartment, we schemed revenge, but all we had to go on was the check. Lucky for karma, there was a phone number printed on it. Our first idea was to write a little program to dial his number repeatedly from my modem, but that would be easily stopped and probably get us in direct trouble. Then Lou got a page from his work. This was back in the one-way pager days. You call the pager's dedicated phone number, it sounds a tone, then you punch digits for the number you want to be sent to the pager. The person with the pager receives the number you entered and presumably calls it. Everyone with a pager made sure that people who needed to get a hold of them had the number for their pager. You'd see pager numbers in print and TV ads all the time for various services. Boom! Angelic choir sings. Heavenly light goes off. Lou's pager number and my pager number had the same prefix, middle three digits. What if we randomly dial numbers with that prefix and page them all to this guy's number? So we order a pizza, open some beers, and start looking through the yellow pages at locksmiths and tow truck services to find more pager prefixes. We wind up with a dozen or so. After that, it's half an hour of coding in ye olde Borland C++. I put together a program that would cycle through our list of known prefixes and add a random final four digits to get a random pager. It calls the pager's number, pauses, then dials this jerk's number and throws a 911 suffix on there for good measure, which is something people with pagers understand to indicate an emergency of some kind. The whole thing was just generating different strings of numbers with different pager prefixes. The commas made pauses since you'd need to connect to the paging service before you can enter the message. Make string, send a modem, wait for no carrier, hang up, repeat. We start eating the pizza and let it fly. I was very picky about my devices, so my modem was a US robotics courier. You could set an S register to control how long it would sound each tone when dialing. Uber nerds like myself would keep tinkering with that to get as fast as possible while still being recognized by the phone service. It was very fast. It could run through four pages per minute, so this guy would get 240 calls an hour. We just watched it run and laughed our butts off. We realized pretty early on that we didn't really know if it was working, so we wandered down to the 7-Eleven and called him from a payphone, just in case he could somehow trace it or the popo were on the case and watching. A man answered and I said, Hello, I got a page at this number. I heard an audible sigh and then he just hung up. Gold. We ended up running it for a few hours, then let it go quiet for a few days. Then we scheduled it to start dialing the middle of the night every few nights. Plus, we'd fire it up by hand randomly whenever we had a party. We checked again from the 7-Eleven after a week and it went to an answering machine, which did the rapid tone at the end of the greeting to indicate the tape was full. We reasoned that the line was still ringing anyway, so we kept at it for another month or so. Eventually, we got the disconnected warning when we made one of our regular checkups. I'm sure he just changed the number. I like to think about that guy answering the phone after a few days of silence when we started it up. I can vividly imagine his response at the, did someone page me to this number? As he slams the phone down and then it rings again a few seconds later. Or of course, coming home from work and having an answering machine full of random people asking about being paged. And yeah, we annoyed several thousand people into calling this guy by the end, but each of those people was only put out for a single call. A cost, yes but a necessary one for justice. Have you ever heard of a pager before this story? Or did you have no clue what it was? Please let us know. Oh, I bet none of them knew. Whether or not they'll admit it in the comments is another question. Karen tries to get my pet duck put down. I live in a pretty nice neighborhood in a town home. There's an overflow nearby my house that's about 30 seconds away from my house. My neighbor from across the street has pet ducks that she had kept in her garage until they could live without needing the heat lamp. The day she let the little ducks out to the overflow, they walked straight to my front door and stayed until I followed them to the little overflow pond. This was when I fell in love with them. Their names are Walden and Delilah. Walden is a super social duck, but he was born pigeon-toed. I think y'all can see where this is going. 
At the time, Walden was pretty sick with lead poisoning, but he was healing really well and was quickly regaining strength. The owner of the ducks, we'll call her DL, had given me the role of their uncle as I had been with them since the beginning, so I had the important job of always keeping watch of them when she wasn't. One day, my mom shouted that there was a large gathering of people at the pond, so I ran to see what was going on. A police officer was slowly approaching Walden while Karen was next to him. The instant I saw that, my heart sunk and slowly moved to the front of the small crowd. The police officer picked up Walden and held him in a baby hold and looked towards the crowd. Officer, is this anyone's duck? Me, terrified. Um, yes sir, their name is Walden. Officer, what's wrong with the duck? Me, they have lead poisoning. The main owner is giving them treatment from the vet. Karen, in the stereotypical Karen voice. I thought it had a broken leg because it was moving weird. The officer then proceeded to swing Walden and hold him upside down by the legs. Poor Walden started trying to get free and Delilah was looking up at the cop and quacking. At this rate, I was shaking with anger and fear, but I didn't want to risk anything with the cop. The Karen then had the audacity to pity my baby because he had such terrible owners. Out of some miracle, one of DL's kids pulled up and practically flew out of their car. DL's son. What the heck are you doing? Cop. Is this yours? Swings Walden forward, still holding him by the legs. DL's son. Yes, now put him the heck down. The officer then proceeded to drop Walden and Delilah ran up and did the closest thing to a hug that a duck can do. DL's daughter then came running up from her house with DL on the phone. After she came, I could hear DL chewing the officer out and the phone wasn't even on speaker. When I got home, I collapsed and just kinda cried. It was so stressful. Aftermath. DL and I both happened to meet at the pond when going to check on Walden. She tells me in no uncertain terms what she would have done to that cop if she was there and we just laughed the incident off. She thanked me for speaking up and told me that Walden would have most likely been put down. Well, that's my story. Sorry if it wasn't the best format-wise. I'm writing this on my phone and it's my first post on Reddit. I am doing my job. It's just not with this company. I'm a security guard. With everything going on, we've gotten a lot of new companies and contracts and there have been several stores that hire my company for mask enforcement, basically refusing service for anyone who tries to walk in without a facial covering. This event took place at one of those new contracts for a home improvement job, one that promises that you can save big money shopping here. My job at this location is extremely simple and narrow. If I see someone walk in without a mask, I stand between them and the gate, inquire as to their lack of a mask, and give them the option of purchasing one for less than 50 cents at the nearby customer service desk if they do not have one of their own. For the most part, people are kind and understanding. Many of them apologize, saying they forgot, and quickly dig out a mask from their pocket or a purse and go on about their way. One day, however, I met the Karen. Line up. We've got me. We've got customer service employee, we've got the manager, and we've got the Karen. I had just stopped an elderly gentleman and asked if he had a mask. He laughed, pulled it out of his pocket, saying he always forgets, put it on, and walked through the turnstile. As I'm having the conversation with him, in walks Karen, staring me down. No mask, and almost runs into the elderly gentleman as she tries to rush past me. I, however, step in her way with a kind smile. Hello, ma'am. Do you have a mask today? No, and I don't need one either. Me. I'm sorry. However, the store policy states that everyone is required to wear one. If you need one, you can get one over there, pointing to customer service desk, for just 42 cents. I told you, I don't need a mask. I just need a washing machine. Where are they? Me. I don't know where the washing machines are. However, I can't let you pass this point without a mask. Please either get one on or see the customer service desk to purchase one. What do you mean you don't know where the washing machines are? What kind of incompetent worker are you? Me. I'm not an employee of this store. I work for a third-party security company. I do not know the store, but you cannot go through these gates without a mask. During this time, Karen tries to walk around me multiple times. I keep stepping in front of her, keeping my hands low, and calmly repeating, You need a mask. Karen. You obviously work here, and I don't like your attitude. Either tell me where I can get a washing machine or get the heck out of my way. Me, pointing to the employee. They will be more than happy to help you find what you need, as well as sell you a mask so that you can shop here. 
At this point, employee realizes that something isn't right, as for the most part as a guard, I smile and wave, pace, and don't really interact with customers. So when I'm no longer smiling, standing still, and speaking with a customer, this usually means that something is going wrong. Employee. Hello, what can I do to help you today? Me. She's looking... Karen. I want a washing machine, and he refuses to tell me where they are. He just keeps getting in my way and telling me to wear a mask. Employee. I'm sorry, but he does not work within the store. His job is just to enforce the mask rules. I would be more than happy to help you. Do you have a mask today? No, I don't have one, and I'm not wearing one. Some long-winded rant about HIPAA and her rights. Employee. Well, ma'am, he won't let you in without one, and unless you have one, I would be unable to assist you in getting the washing machine you want. Karen. I've had enough. Get me your manager, now. Employee then gets on her walkie and radios for a manager to come up. Manager. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm doing horrible. Your employees are useless. Refuse to help me and won't even let me in the store. I demand you fire them both. Manager. I'm sorry, but he, pointing to me, is not an employee here. We hired his company to enforce mask policies. Karen. I've already told you, I won't wear one. Now, fire these people and help me get my washing machine. At this point, she is escalating more and more and is getting very close to the manager, which triggers my training. Normally, I'm not allowed to go hands-on. However, there is an exception when there is a significant threat of violence to myself or employees of the company I'm working at, and it's starting to appear as if some violence may happen. Me. Ma'am, I'm going to need you to calm down and please back away from the manager. We don't want any physical contact. I'm not talking to you. You're about to be fired anyway. You might as well go home already. Manager. He's not going to be fired. He's doing his job. And I would be more than happy to take you to our washing machines, but you need to get a mask first. Another five-minute argument during which I'm forced to stand between the manager and Karen as she's getting more and more aggressive. The manager took this chance to motion for an employee to call the police. Manager. At this point, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I won't have you yelling at our security or refusing to follow our policies. Karen. I'm not leaving until you fire this jerk and I get my washing machine, and get out of my way. Don't you know it's rude to get between two people talking? Manager. He's doing his job, making sure nothing happens. We have called the cops. Leave now. About five minutes later, the cops arrive, with Karen screaming that we assaulted her, when all she wanted to do was get a washing machine. And even after the police reviewed the camera footage, she held to her story. As they attempted to trespass her from the store, she swung at me, and luckily missed. That, however, was enough for her to leave the store in handcuffs. I'm not sure why she thought I was an employee. My uniform is gray and black with a bright red logo, and the store's uniform is a lot of blues and greens. But all's well that ends well with Karen in the back of a police car. Have you seen anybody lose it over having to wear a mask or not? And if so, what store was it in? Please let us know. Every time I go to Costco. Am I the jerk for being upset with my son for saying I don't appreciate my wife? Okay. I don't think I'm in the wrong here, but a few family members have jumped on my case about it, so I figured I'd post here on my brother's suggestion. I, 40, male, have a son I'll call Jake, 17, and a daughter I'll call Annie, who's 15. Their mom passed away 8 years ago, and I remarried my wife Kate, 38, female, 5 years ago. My kids actually really like Kate, so it's not a problem between them. So here's the issue. Kate does all of the Christmas shopping. I'm very busy, as I work a lot of hours usually. Kate works full-time, but less hours, so she also does the majority of the house stuff. The last few years, I haven't gotten Kate anything for Christmas. It just doesn't occur to me since she does all the shopping. She mentioned before that it hurts her feelings, and I always apologize, but it isn't something I really think about, so it ends up happening again. I saw Jake wrapping a gift yesterday and asked who it was for, assuming it was for a friend. He said that he and Annie had pulled some money together and gotten Kate a gift for Christmas this year. I told him that was sweet, but they shouldn't waste their money on gifts for adults. He got upset at that and told me that it wasn't wasting money, that he and Annie just wanted to show her some appreciation since I don't. I said Kate shouldn't be telling him these things, and if she had a problem, she needed to deal with me directly. But Jake cut me off and said Kate never said a word, but they had eyes. They could see that she was the only one without a gift on Christmas morning, and she was the only one who ever cleaned up and did the shopping. I got really angry that he said that, but Jake talked over me, saying how despite Kate working full-time, I still expected her to take care of them, do all the household stuff, 
do all the shopping, and even then I wasn't happy. I always found something to complain about. Said that even though I knew it hurt her to be discarded, even though she's the one who put in all the work, I still couldn't do something as simple as buy something off Amazon or stop by the store and pick out a card. It wasn't like Kate was high maintenance or had expensive tastes. She just wanted to be acknowledged, and he was surprised she stayed with me with how unappreciative I was. I told him he was being extremely rude to me and left to cool down. I spoke to my brother who said that Jake was right. I was a jerk who didn't appreciate Kate and that it wasn't like Christmas was a surprise. It was the same date every year and I had plenty of time to plan for something. I actively chose not to and it was a real jerk move to try and tell my kids they shouldn't care about her feelings just because I don't. I don't think that judgment is fair at all. Of course I care about her. It's just not something I think about. He suggested I post on here since I think my son's being a jerk and he thinks I'm the one being the jerk. So you decide. Who's the jerk here? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his son? Please let us know. His kids actually sound very thoughtful. I'm glad they're sticking up for Kate. Am I the jerk for telling my wife to grow up and staying Christmas with our daughters at my parents without her? My wife, who's 40, and I, who am 42, male, together for 23 years, married for 17. We have four daughters together. Our relationship is good. We don't fight and we don't have any major issues. When we had our oldest, we decided that she would stay at home with her and our future kids. It worked well until last year. As our daughters got older, they didn't need that much attention from her. It caused some problems. She was used to being a full-time mom, but our daughters are quite independent for their ages, so she got a lot of free time on her hands and didn't know what to do. We discussed things, and I told her that this would be a good time for her to finish her master's degree, but she wasn't very keen on that, so she joined the gym and a few book clubs. Then our oldest introduced her to TikTok, and she got addicted to that. She started posting stuff about our private life. But hey, she wasn't bored, and she was happy, so I went along. I even participated in a few. Then she started doing pranks on me. It was particularly funny because I got scared very easily. The pranks started to get more elaborate. I told her to stop and we had a lot of heated arguments about this. In March, I was taking a bath. She got into the bathroom and dumped a bucket of ice on me while recording the whole thing. I freaked out, got up very fast, slipped, and hit my head pretty hard on the tub. I am a big guy, 6 foot 4, 248 pounds, so it was pretty bad. I woke up in a hospital two days later. Apparently, I got a hematoma from the accident and had to get brain surgery. I had to stay in the hospital for almost two weeks. I'm still doing physiotherapy sessions and don't have total control of my left arm. After the accident, the previously good relationship that my wife had with my family, my mom has three sons. I'm the oldest and we started dating very early. So my wife was the daughter that my mom never had. Took a pretty big hit. They got into a few fights with her and I had to step in and ask everyone to calm down a bit. On to the issue. My wife and I alternate holidays between her family and mine. One year we go to Christmas with her family, the next one we stay with my parents. This year, we're supposed to stay with my parents, but she doesn't want that. My family still makes some snarky comments and my brothers are pretty passive aggressive with her. She doesn't want to go to my parents this year because of that. I told her that I am going with or without her. She told me that I can't take our daughters without her. We got into a fight and I told her that I am going. She told me that she won't drive me there. I can't drive since the accident. I called my brother and he's okay with driving us there. Our daughters are very excited to see my parents. We got into a fight and she is currently not speaking with me. Her sisters think I am a jerk and that I'm being too harsh on her because the lockdown was hard on her. I told a coworker about this and he's on the fence. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I think I'm going to start pranking you, Mr. Reddit. Am I the jerk for not giving my employees a holiday bonus this year? I own and operate my own small business. I currently have 10 employees working for me, and in the past, I've given everyone a holiday bonus at the end of the year. Even with everything that has gone on in the past year, my business has done very well, and we are on pace to have an increased profit of almost 10% compared to last year. I have asked a lot of my employees this year, and they have met or exceeded all of my expectations. I am incredibly proud of the work they have done. However, even though my business has done well, I have incurred a lot of personal expenses and debt this year that I had not planned for. I had some health problems and also went through an emotionally, mentally, and financially exhaustive divorce. So even with the increased profit from my company, I will be taking in less money than I did last year, whether or not I give out bonuses.
I recently had a meeting with my number two at my company and explained this to him. I told him that I would not be able to give out bonuses this year and told him it would probably be better if he told everyone since he has a better relationship with the employees and sees them all day to day. He said he understands where I'm coming from, but he refused to be the one to give them the news. He said that it's my company and I'm free to treat my employees however I want, but he will not be turned into the bad guy because of a decision I am making on my own. He said that many of the employees know that the company is on a better pace than last year, so it's not unreasonable of them to expect the same bonus or even a better one than before. I told him I have to look out for myself as well and I've had a tough year. He said it was unfair of me to punish my employees for my personal problems. He also said he wouldn't be surprised if this caused a permanent rift between me and the employees and that some will probably look elsewhere for work as a result. I want to believe that my employees will be understanding of the situation and will continue to be loyal based on our past working history and not the short term. In the past, I would use my wife as a barometer for this kind of decision, but when I reached out to her to get her opinion, she called me a greedy jerk who can't see beyond his own problems. I will admit there is a fair amount of acrimony between the two of us right now, so I feel that probably played into what she said, and I don't think she sees this the same way she would have before the divorce. I need to make a final decision on this quickly, and I'm leaning towards not giving out bonuses like my gut tells me to. But would that make me a jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or not? Please let us know. Karen and company want to pet my service dog. This happened yesterday, and while, as usual, many people will call me a jerk, I still don't feel bad about it. I'm on my way home from work and decide that I need to do my grocery shopping then because I'm exhausted and know I won't get out again once I get home. Important to note at this point, for those that don't know, I have a service dog in training, Sadie, that goes everywhere with me. So I was in the membership version of America's most popular store and browsing to see what groceries I'd need for the month when I hear the familiar high-pitched squeal of an entitled kid. Now this isn't an uncommon occurrence, as anyone who's seen my dog will tell you that she's absolutely adorable. Half Great Pyrenees, half Catahoula Leopard Dog, 7 months old and about 65 pounds. She knows better than to interact with people at this point, but she does as she's trained as she sees the kid running up and puts herself between myself and the kid, not really in a guard stance, but sideways between myself and the kid and touching the back of my leg so I know where the person is approaching from. In this case, I already knew, but I still turned around and gave her a treat. She's still learning after all and told her to heal. She does as she's told and the kid slows and comes to a stop now that I'm between him and Sadie. We've got entitled mom and we've got the kid. Kid, your dog is so cute. I want to pet it. Me, I'm sorry, but see the vest with the patches she's wearing? It says service dog, do not touch. That means she's working right now and can't be distracted. I don't really like kids much beyond my niece and nephew, so I'm not good at telling ages and didn't know if he could read. I figured he knew to obey signs though, so I thought if I told him what it said, he'd understand. Nope, entitled kid. What's a service dog? She doesn't look busy, just one pet? He's not being rude, just sounds more curious than anything, so I don't really mind explaining and I notice a woman push her card up behind him, so I assume she's his mom and I feel a bit more relaxed about the situation. Me. A service dog is a dog that helps people do things. There are all types of jobs dogs can do, but they can't be distracted because their owners need them to pay attention to only them in case something happens. Kid. But she's just sitting there right now. If she's not going to get back to work, you should let me pet her. Now at this point, I should have noticed the, if she's not going to get back to work, red flag, and guessed he was being raised by a Karen. But honestly, I've really only dealt with a few Karens in my life and didn't think much of it, just that he was a kid being annoying. Me to his mom. Ma'am, could you please explain it to him? I don't have kids, so I'm not too good at this. I was admittedly probably sounding annoyed in all honesty, but I was still trying to be polite, and I don't think I was being unreasonable here. But she seemed to take offense. Entitled mom. Why? He just wants to pet her. It's not a big deal, and he's been acting really good today, and he deserves a treat. I don't see why you won't let him pet her. Me, definitely annoyed now. Ma'am, she's a working dog. She couldn't be distracted. I don't mean to be rude, but you're also not wearing masks, and she could get sick. I'd really prefer no one mess with her. We're in Texas, and I'm pretty sure everyone has heard how many people are sick right now, but the majority of people still refuse to wear masks, and of all the shops I've been to, only one store still has a no mask, no entry rule. 
Shout out to Skechers. Thanks for being proactive. Entitled Mom. Oh, you're one of those people. Insert eye roll. Just let him pet the stupid dog so we can move on. The stupid sickness is over with. Everything is open now. Me. I think we're done here. And I just turn and walk off, keeping Sadie in my sight just in case. It should have ended there. She should have just told her kid I was a jerk or something and moved on. But if she did, I wouldn't be posting this. Instead, she leaves her cart behind, walks up behind me, and grabs my shoulder. It's at this point I should mention that I have Sadie because of my PTSD. Now, usually it's controllable. I'm on meds to help with anxiety, and I'm in therapy and don't usually have a problem. Heck, I even love music festivals and raves, and have only had a problem one time when I was trying to leave EDC early and got stopped at the gate because they were about to set off fireworks, and something about the bangs and being close enough to feel the vibrations of that many fireworks got to me. I guess with everything that's been going on, and not having to worry about people randomly grabbing me and stuff, I've kind of let my guard down a bit. This set me off though, and without even thinking, I grabbed her hand and spun around, twisting her arm and pushed her as hard as I could, sending her sprawling to the ground. What the heck is wrong with you? I yelled, and I said some other stuff, but I was mad and honestly don't remember what I said. Something about no means no, and I don't want her nasty hands on me. At this point, Sadie had gotten between us and her stance and had begun to bark, loudly and repetitively, as she's been trained so she can get someone's attention. I noticed that Sadie was off her leash because somehow the kid had gotten in front of my cart and unhooked it. Luckily, Sadie is the best girl and doesn't need a leash to do her job. She never even thought about running and just stood in front of me barking. Stupid kid was crying after seeing what happened to his mom and getting scared that the cute puppy was now looking pretty darn mean. Now, Sadie wouldn't hurt a fly, but this woman didn't know that and Sadie has a very intimidating bark. Without even standing up, this woman was scrambling to get back from her and grabs at her cart to stand up. Of course, employees start running to see what's going on, and when one gets there, she asks what's going on. Entitled Mom This man's dog tried to attack me. I was just trying to get his attention and it bit me. Now, I've browsed this sub enough to know where this was headed and I wasn't in the mood. Me Look, just call the cops and grab the camera footage. I'm not gonna play the he said, she said game. The employee calls for the manager, who calls the cops, and asks us to come to the front office to get things sorted out. We start to head toward the front office, but once there, Entitled Mom says she doesn't have time for this and has places to be and just walks out of the store. No one tries to stop her, but the manager looks at the footage and prints off her face to put on the banned people wall, and when the cops arrive, they say there's nothing they can do since she already left. I got employee discount for my food, which was nice, but left in a pretty bad mood because of the interaction. After getting home, I gave Sadie a small slab of steak for being such a good girl and I just took a shower and went to bed. Didn't get anything done that I needed to, but it had been a long day and I was extra annoyed. So that's it, sadly. No real repercussions for Karen other than maybe a bruiser or two where she hit the tiles and a traumatized kid. But if this sub is any indication, Karens don't learn from stuff like that. Here's hoping the kid learned a thing or two, at least. Karen confronts me for buying our house when her son wanted it. Brief backstory. Back in March, I, 25 female, and my partner, 27 male, bought a house. Big deal for us, and we're so glad we managed to pull this off, especially right before lockdown got bad. It's a livable fixer-upper. The lady that lived here bought it in 67 and was the only owner before us, and she made no updates in that time. It keeps us busy, and that's worked out really well being home so often. Now to the event with Entitled Mom. In May, my big project was pulling out some nasty bushes that had taken over a huge chunk of the front side yard. It was hot. I was sweaty. I'm digging out roots and throwing branches. As I'm right up front and making a pretty drastic change to our yard, people notice. Most people stop by, say a quick hello from the car, and drive away. But not Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom pulls up in a shiny black Suburban from the opposite side of the road parks the wrong way and rolls down her window. I'd say she's in her 50s or 60s. Gray slash white bob cut hair. I stand up and pause my music. The following conversation isn't exact but pretty close as this conversation was just so entitled. Entitled mom. Hey, did you buy this house? Me. Yep, just moved in last month. Did you know the family? Me. Um, that sold it? Not really. We just got lucky they chose us, I guess. 
trying to be nice, but kind of off-put, she's asked none of the typical neighbor questions. We made a great offer. Entitled Mom. Yeah, my son really wanted this house. He grew up in this neighborhood, you know. Me. Oh, darn. Yeah, houses move fast right now. He spent his whole life in this area. He really deserved to stay in the neighborhood, you know? Me. Yeah, that's too bad. Major what the heck feelings now. Entitled Mom. How much did you offer? Me. Not about to tell her details. Over asking price. We were proactive. Well, my son really wanted that house. Me. Feeling quite awkward with this whole situation and just looking to shoo this lady along. Yeah, well, I'm sure more houses will go up for sale around here. Well, that doesn't help him now, does it? He had his heart set on that house. I just exaggeratedly shrug and decide to resume my root cutting to try and give her the message. Entitled Mom. You're probably flipping it. He would have loved it. Me. Uh, no we're not. We're staying long term. Yeah, right. She doesn't leave. I'm wondering if I should go inside or something. She just keeps looking at me expecting me to say something. I keep cutting at a root. Entitled Mom. Is it just you, or did your family help you get it? Me, getting pretty short in tone. My partner and I bought it together. My grandkids would have loved the yard. A loved yard makes a house a home, you know? Me, not looking up. Well, my dogs will love it, especially once I'm done. Seriously? I just scoff, pull my root out, throw it on the pile. I feel her eyes watching me. Me, really ready to be done. Well, have a good day. Then with the last glare and an ugh, she speeds off, leaving a quite annoyed and bewildered me in the dirty glory, mulling over what the heck just happened. Did this lady just try to guilt trip me because we bought a house her son wanted? Indeed, apparently. What the heck? Definitely the most unwelcoming interaction I've had since we moved in, and I have not seen her since. Have you ever had someone try to guilt trip you over something they shouldn't have? If so, what was it? Please let us know. I'll guilt trip you right now if you forgot to smash that like button. Would I be the jerk if I lied to my wife about her Christmas gift? First, some important context. My lovely wife is always too hard on herself, even in regard to her relationship with our two kids, who are five and three. She frequently tells me that she wishes she had the same kind of connection with them that I have. Now, I've always gotten along great with kids. It's fairly effortless for me to interact with them, engage their attention and make them laugh. This goes for my own kids as well. I'm silly, weird, crazy, and they eat it right up. I'm their clown. My wife, although an exceedingly devoted and loving mother, is not as silly as I am, and so the kids tend to gravitate towards me when we're all together. This makes her feel like a loser, or like she isn't fun enough, or doesn't have as strong a connection with them as I do. I reassure her that their bond is just as strong and even more beautiful than the one I have. Again, I'm just a big clown to them. They love their mother dearly and frequently show her lots of love and affection. However, my wife tends not to absorb those good moments as easily or as deeply as the times the kids prefer me, for lack of a better word. I try to tone things down so I'm not sucking all the air out of the room and help her get more bonding time with them while I sit the heck down and shut the heck up. Regardless, she's still been really down about it the last few days. So here's my would I be the jerk. My wife and I don't usually exchange Christmas gifts, nor do we buy each other gifts from the kids, not our style. But this year, my wife will be getting something from the kids. When we give it to her, she'll hear that while five-year-old and I were at the mall to mail off Christmas cards, five-year-old saw something in a store window and said he wanted to give it to mom for Christmas. How could I say no? She'll feel warm knowing that he thought of her and wanted to give her a gift from his heart. Unfortunately, it will be a lie. In fact, I suggested we walk around to find a gift and I picked it out while he goofed around in the store. Sure, I showed it to him and asked if he wanted to get it for mommy for Christmas and he said yes, but it was not his idea. I'm worried I'd be the jerk, first for lying to my wife, even if it's to make her feel better, but also because it may make her feel worse that she didn't get anything for me from the kids and it would just backfire. So would I be the jerk? Edit. I'm 99% certain my 5-year-old will not spill the beans and expose this lie, as his speech skills are not adequate enough to really articulate it. But that 1% chance is still a risk, I suppose. Edit 2. I really cannot discern a concrete verdict in either direction, which affirms just how complicated and tough this situation is. But I thank everyone for their honest advice and feedback. If I had to place my chips, I'd place them on the do not lie to her bet for the win. 
A lot of people suggested homemade cards, pictures, breakfast in bed, which unfortunately do not seem any better. Those are all things I would have to suggest and encourage with the kids, but nothing they would come up with from the heart, which was the whole point of making my wife feel more valued for even a second, so really are not any different than the gift we bought, I feel. Also, for the record, my wife is not the one who administers discipline or is always the bad guy. In fact, I am the tougher, stricter one in that regard, and my wife spoils them much more than I do. But when I'm not administering discipline, the kids and I have a lot of silly fun, so I feel it tips the scales. Final edit, I have officially been labeled the jerk if I go through with this plan. Thanks so much for all of the thoughtful advice and kind words. I'll be taking them into consideration. Well, what do you think? Would OP be the jerk if he did this or not? Please let us know. I think it sounds kind of sweet to be honest. I wish you would do something like that for me, Reddit boy. Kevin yells at hearing impaired employee for ignoring him. This happened a few hours ago. I wanted to go to Stallmart early before the crazy last minute shoppers flooded out for the weekend. I picked up a few things for baking and couldn't remember where to find molasses. Rather than waste time combing up and down the aisles with too many people, I sought out an employee. I heard someone say, excuse me, a couple times with less patience and saw him and the male employee he was trying to call out to. The employee was stocking some canned goods and didn't seem to notice the man at all. The customer grabbed the employee's shoulder and scared the crap out of him. The male customer got in the employee's face and said, I know you heard me, jerk. You ignore all your customers. When the employee's back was to me, that was when I noticed the I am hearing impaired in bold white letters on the back of his blue vest. I was heated by the customer already and knowing he was harassing an employee and impaired at that really burned me up. I went up to the man as the employee backed away from him, clearly alarmed by the customer's abrasive action. I told the man, excuse me, but you don't need to be so harsh. He wasn't ignoring you, he's hearing impaired. That don't mean he can't hear me talking. The man futilely tried to argue. I resisted face palming, especially after touching things in the store. The man was too unnerved to do anything, so I asked the man what he needed. He said he couldn't find something. I didn't care to remember what and told him exactly what aisle it was in. He left and the shaken employee leaned against his locked cart, seemingly on the verge of crying. My American Sign Language wasn't great, but I knew enough to be polite. I signed, are you okay? His eyes lit up for a moment and he signed back, I'm fine, thank you. He went on to sign more, but I only caught jerk and rude customer and scared, which was enough for me to get the gist. Over the years in my retail job, I picked up some American Sign Language for retail workers and online videos to be more helpful to the occasional deaf or hearing impaired customers who came into the store I worked at, so I knew enough key signs to hold at least a short conversation. I signed, sorry, I only know a little ASL. He gave me a friendly smile and signed, no problem, did you need help with anything? I didn't know the sign for molasses, so I spelled it and shrugged feeling a little sheepish since I almost never had to sign. He signed to me where to go, but I didn't catch much of it, and he could tell. He let out a little laugh and signaled for me to follow him, so I did, and he led me to the aisle the molasses was in. My vertically challenged self wouldn't have been able to reach it, so I signed Grandma for the brand I wanted. He reached up and handed it to me. I signed, thank you, I appreciate it. He signed something and pointed to the jar. He did this twice, and I realized he was teaching me the sign for molasses. I signed it back to him, and he signed, yes, with a smile. We both laughed, and he asked where I learned sign language. I told him online, and just practiced every now and then, mostly for funsies, and because I was fascinated by the language. He reached into his pocket for a notepad and pen to scribble something. I patiently waited until he handed the paper to me, and I read it. You showed me kindness I almost never see. Thank you for helping me and respecting my community when many don't. Never stop learning. I wish more people were like you. I signed, thank you. I'm nickname. Nice to meet you. He signed back. I'm so-and-so. Nice to meet you. Rather than shake hands, we bumped elbows and parted ways. That guy really made my day, and I bet I probably made his week. It breaks my heart to see terrible people being unnecessarily rude to workers, impaired or otherwise. What's so hard about being a decent human being? If I were in so-and-so's shoes, I'd be grateful to anyone who at least made an effort to communicate with me in a way we both understood. When I made my purchase, I saw the rude customer from before in the other line getting an attitude because his card was declining. He noticed me as I grabbed my bags. 
I gave him a smile and signed, jerk, and left. Have you ever learned any sign language? And if not, would you like to? Please let us know. What's the sign for manager? Bullies got what was coming to them. For the first two years of high school, I was badly bullied. The first year, they did the usual things bullies do. Name call, gossip, spread rumors, so on and so forth with the particularly bad exception of once holding a glass bottle above my head in theater class and pretending to bring it down to get me. I didn't notice at the time and wasn't told until the end of the second year of high school by my friends. This went on for most of the school year. In the end, I got too fed up with it and complained to the head of my year who gave them a stern warning and their parents were called. They left me alone until the summer arrived. When I got back after the summer, the things they had done to me before started back up again but this time it was worse. They had pushed me into the walls, put more venom in the name calling, threatened me in different ways. The gossiping got more frequent, the rumors were spread more often, etc. One thing that particularly irked me was when I sat next to one of them for a class and they had insult my religious background, our holidays, and my family for practicing it. Meanwhile, I kept the mindset that I would not insult their holidays in anger because it would make me just as bad and they'd go running to the teacher if I were to say anything, so I kept my mouth shut. Now for the two week long culmination. In my country, every school has a member of law enforcement, let's call them the awesome, that works on the campus to deal with any stupid criminal acts students commit. This is important for later. One day I'm ranting about how much of a pain in the butt these guys are to my mother when she asks me in a concerned tone if they do anything else the name call. I list the things above and my mother has a look of, oh heck no, not my kid, on her face and calls my dad over so I can explain everything to him that I just said to her. I explain. Now both of my parents have a look of, oh heck no, not my kid, on their face. That night, my mother sends an email to my year head, no response. So next, she directly calls my year head and explains the situation. The bullies get another stern warning. But this now gets really good. The stern warning didn't do anything, but within the next week, my father ran into the awesome that worked in my school. My dad tells them about what was going on, and the awesome set up an individual meeting with each of my bullies to explain in a law enforcement manner what would happen if they continued what they were doing. They didn't stop, so I complained again, and this time, a meeting with the awesome, my head of year, myself, and my bullies was set up. It was glorious. At first, they denied everything, again and again, until the awesome used the best law enforcement eye I've ever seen, and they broke. And I genuinely thought my bullies were just going to get another, even more threatening warning, until I explained what one of them had said about my religion. The awesome went the most scarily calm I've ever seen him and tore him a new one. The little jerk had forgotten that those kinds of comments were classified as crimes in my country and could get him a criminal record. The awesome very calmly explained that if I had come to them and filed a report, it would have been investigated and probably would have gotten him criminally charged. I felt lighter walking out of that meeting, like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. So Reddit, that's the story of my bullies getting chewed out, then almost being charged with a crime. Has anybody ever bullied you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Cashiers bully me everywhere I go. They're just so hard to deal with. Am I the jerk for telling brother-in-law and sister-in-law that their lifestyle is what made them bankrupt? My brother-in-law and sister-in-law, hubby's brother and wife, have always had a problem of keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. Nobody can ever have anything better or newer than them. While it's never really bothered any of us, it's just something that is there and has become a family joke. They do this to everyone and have even done it to hubby and myself. Up to a certain point, this has never been a problem, but well, times have changed and now that has caught up with them. He told me that brother-in-law called and asked for money because they were pretty behind on house and car payments and they were about to start losing things to repossession. I asked how this was possible when they were still doing all the things that they have been doing. He said that they never recovered from last year when they lost their jobs and never took lower paying positions, and they never did anything to accommodate to their new salaries. We have the money to help them out, but it would have meant that we would have had to put off some things that we had planned for 2021. Hubby said that something didn't feel right and called his brother to ask them to send over all their bills, expenses, and pay stubs so that we could look at it and see what we could do to help, which they did reluctantly. I ran the numbers four different ways and no matter how I ran it, 
there was no way for me to be able to find how they could pull out of this, and in all honesty, they are very much bankrupt. The long story short of it is that they are filing bankruptcy next month and will be moving in with us, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and three kids. Our house will be maxed out. Here is where I might be the jerk. In order to maintain their appearance, hubby and I are the only ones who know. Then tonight, we had dinner with the family, and we heard brother-in-law and sister-in-law talking about the neighbors and how they are going on vacation in a couple of weeks, and next year, they are going to do something. Hubby and I listened in on this for a few minutes, and they kept going, and I got upset, and went storming into the living room, asking what the heck they were thinking. First, it was, how dare I leak this information without their approval? Then it was basically, they said that they had a lifestyle that they have become accustomed to, and once this bankruptcy was complete, then they would have extra money to move on with their life, and it's not fair to them or their kids to have to completely change. I reminded them that it was their lifestyle that is exactly what put them into bankruptcy, and they need to learn to better manage their money. So, am I the jerk for telling my brother-in-law and sister-in-law that their lifestyle is what put them into bankruptcy? Edit due to character limit. To tie up any questions, when brother-in-law and sister-in-law and family move in, they're going to be living with us rent-free and will just have to cover their personal expenses. This is to help them get money saved up so that they will be able to find a place of their own. Hubby and I are planning on getting new cars next year. We were originally going to use our cars for trade-ins, but now we are going to just sign our cars over to them and put extra money down for a down payment on our cars. Hopefully in a year, maybe less, they will be able to move into their own place. They will be moving the kids' college funds into other people's names so that it will not be touched in the bankruptcy. Edit 2. Hello everyone. So first, I want to thank you all for your comments and advice. I want to assure you that I have read all and have taken all into consideration. This was extremely eye-opening. When Hubby and I made the decision to do this, it was made in a hurry and I slash we admit that we didn't completely think the whole thing through. Thanks to all of you, we saw all of the red flags and in all honesty, we both were feeling the same way, just not sure how to talk to each other. So basically what it comes down to is that brother-in-law, sister-in-law and family are not moving in and are not getting our cars. After last night's dinner conversation, both of us saw how much they don't think this is a serious matter. And if that's the case, then they are never going to take us seriously living with us. They need to figure this out on their own. We had a Zoom meeting this morning with Hubby's other sibling and they are all telling us the same thing not to let them move in with us and not to let them have our cars. They all agree that they need to hit rock bottom as well. They still have some time before all of this goes through, so they have time to save up for a place that they can move into and maybe find a way to get different cars. I put together a budget that will work for them. I have resources that will help with different things as well. I made them a budget spreadsheet like what we use for our finances. I have a friend of mine who is going to try and find a place that they will be able to rent while they come through the worst of it all. Taking any of them in is an absolute last resort. I feel horrible for their kids because they are going to miss out on a lot because of this. They are most likely going to lose their college funds. They never did anything wrong, but they are going to have to pay for their parents' mistakes. If they were not underwater with their house, they could have sold it and just paid off a lot of the debt with that profit, but at this point, nothing is going to help. Had they not lost their jobs last year, they would have been okay. Both at the time had high executive level jobs that afforded them to do all of the things that they had done, but their new jobs and salaries just don't have that much power at this point to pull them out of it. We are going to have to get their parents involved in this, which both are in their 80s. They might actually have to get an advance on their inheritance to get moved. I don't know. Hubby and I feel that we have done more than what we should have done, so now it's up to them. Edit 3. About the college funds, they're just basic savings accounts. All three kids are not at an age where they can hold their own bank accounts without a parent signature. So while they have their names on the accounts, brother-in-law and sister-in-law are also on the accounts, so they are going to lose out no matter what. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let them move in with you or not? Please let us know. I sure wouldn't. I might put up a tent out back for them though. Equal pay for equal work. I used to work in a medical lab and all of my teammates were male and I am female. I did almost twice as much as anyone else and got paid less than anyone else in the same position in the entire lab, including females. Eventually I noticed that I did more work when my coworkers were asking me to help them out with their job because I was efficient and had extra time. I asked for a raise or to be put on an easier project. My boss said no because I made sure things were done on time 
and I was the only one who could actually do all of their work. I decided to do the exact same amount of work as the other coworkers that make the next lowest amount of money, so it's still more than me, but also pretty low. When I started doing this, I started getting behind in my work and had a meeting with my boss. We all send daily updates to the team, so I pulled out my coworkers daily updates and my daily updates and showed them that they were exactly the same. I'm on a different project, but it takes the same amount of time to do the same work, it's just that my project is more intensive. I asked to be bumped up to that coworker's salary, and if I was bumped up, I would do more work. He said no. I went to HR, and they said talk to him. I talked to his boss, who told me to talk to him, who said no. He stopped complaining about being behind and asked my project manager to help me out with my project. He ended up being utterly useless and acting like a kid when I explained I was done with work and showed him my coworker's previous daily update and explained that's all I got paid to do, so that's all I'm doing. He basically just stalked me to watch what I was doing, but my boss only wanted proof I was actually in the lab, not that I was doing work. I decided to amp it up. My next lowest paid coworker made 12% more than me, so I did 12% less than him. Now, I still have all my previous skills, so I would just sit myself at a computer and just play games or whatnot for the remainder of my shift. It drove him up the wall, especially because that's all I could do in the rules, so if he asked me to not do that, I had email chains between him and I about where and what I could do during breaks. We had two required 15-minute breaks on the clock and an off-the-clock lunch. However, we can't use our phone in the lab. Most chairs were in dirty, biohazardous areas, and clean chairs were limited, and it would be rude to move those. But sitting on the floor in the locker room was unprofessional. We could use our phones in offices, but we couldn't take breaks in there because we'd be a distraction. The building was huge and had one break room that was a 3-4 to four minute walk to from my lab. And breaks were 15 minutes total, so that was useless. I tried sitting in the hall, but creepy guys kept coming by once they figured out my routine. So, I'm taking my breaks in the lab on the lab computer, but it's 15 minutes uninterrupted. If you get asked a question or interrupted in any way, then you restart your 15 minutes. There was no way I was going to be in the lab and it'd be quiet and I wouldn't get interrupted. Especially if I went down the BuzzFeed quiz black hole, everyone wanted to go at it as well. So, I could take my 15 minute breaks in the lab and get them to last 2 hours within the rules. I was in the lab the whole time, and since my PM was keeping an eye on me, I could turn around and ask if he needed anything since he kept passing by, then start my timer back. Anyway, I got away with it long enough to find a new job, especially since I applied to jobs on the clock. I quit and am now making 45% more in salary, and now they are over 1,750 samples behind, which is two weeks worth even for me, a month at their current rate. I never got more than 400 samples behind at my laziest, and that almost broke my laziness strike because I actually have an alright work ethic. Upper management, meaning two or three people above his boss, are now getting involved to see why the samples are so far behind, and action is taken to look into what can be done. I am friends with two of my old coworkers. One apologized to me and said he thought I was lazy and not doing my work, but now it's even affecting him since two people were taking off his team to replace me and I'm no longer organizing and cleaning. Messiness gives me extreme panic, so I always organized, just didn't let my boss know, and now my old coworker can't find anything because nothing is where it belongs. The other one passed my old boss and said, Bet you wish you just gave her the $2 an hour she asked for, and he made a nervous laugh but didn't say anything. A wrong order and sweet vindication from another customer. I was recently telling a friend about this experience that happened to me a while back and has stuck with me ever since. I felt this crowd could appreciate and relate. I was working at this place that could best be described as a trendy, healthy-ish upscale diner. You could get your classic burgers and shakes, but it specialized in offering a variety of high quality meats, venison, boar, etc. One slow afternoon, this woman came in for lunch. She was a semi-regular and we were vaguely familiar with each other. She was always nice enough and the interactions were always about as normal and transactional as they could be. She would get a typical business person lunch and be on her way. So this one particular afternoon when I came to take her order, she wanted to know about the buffalo burger. She had never had one. Would I recommend it? What did it taste like? How did it compare to normal beef, etc.? The buffalo burger was my personal favorite on the menu, so I was eager to go into detail on it, what it tasted like, how they were raised, etc., etc. She was sold. She made the classic nervous leap and proclaimed, All right, let's do it. 
So 10 minutes or so later, I come to drop her food, and she gives it the blank, inquisitive stare of the, what the heck is this? And she says, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what this is. I ordered the turkey burger. My head is instantly spinning. Miscommunications happen, but we had deeply discussed her order. There was no possible mistaking. I try to politely remind her of the conversation, and she stared at me like I was an alien. And what she said next was the most bizarre. There is no possible way I would order a buffalo burger. I don't even eat red meat. So at this point, I'm not sure what universe I'm living in anymore. But whatever. It would appear it's time to get the lady a turkey burger cooking. We fix things up for her ASAP. She was completely polite, and the rest of her stay went about as normal as possible. Now, before I get to the end, I can't stress how much this was blowing my mind. As someone who had served for many years, I had come to understand that miscommunications can happen on both sides. People can think that they said things they didn't say, and people can think they heard things they didn't hear. But this one was unlike any other situation I'd ever encountered. There was no Freudian slip here. We had deeply and completely discussed her order. So at any rate, I apologize one final time as I drop the check and she settles up. A few minutes later, I come back to clear her table, as well as the table immediately next to her where two gentlemen had been sitting this whole time. I pick up their check, which had a nice big tip, as well as the following message. By the way, she definitely ordered the buffalo. The vindication was so sweet. I wasn't in saying after all. To this day, I've been so curious to understand what that woman thought she was talking about. I can't make any sense of it. Speaking of burgers, what's your favorite kind of burger of all time? Please let us know. Big Macs over everything, bruh. DoorDash sucks. This happened a couple of days ago, but I'm finally feeling cranky enough to vent about it. My job is open for sit down and we do take out for pickup only. You call us, I take your order, I ring it in, you come pay me and I hand you your food. We were not on any kind of dash, any type of eating that could be Uber, nothing. We found out that someone, or the app itself, put our restaurant on the app by themselves with food we didn't have available and incorrect prices. So someone calls in an order. I enter it, and to everyone's surprise, a dasher shows up. They pay me with their card, DoorDash card, and of course leave no tip. It dawns on me that the dashers are getting orders sent to them somehow and then calling it in themselves. I have no idea what the heck this loophole was, but I was sick of being stiffed on $100 plus orders, especially after the owner of the pub said we aren't on DoorDash. So a few days ago, this happens again. I tell him we aren't on DoorDash, and I have no idea how he got this order, but don't do it again. He asks how long the food will be, so I tell him 5 to 10 minutes still. He gets super mad and says, cancel it, cancel the order, and storms out. So I tell Kitchen not to make it, I avoid the order, go on with my life. 25 minutes later, a new dasher shows up. I'm confused as I have no orders. He shows me the canceled order. I tell him, no, you guys canceled it. The customer? No, the very angry jerk who left here almost 30 minutes ago. I tell him we don't have the order anymore, the food isn't and won't be ready, and they leave. I open DoorDash and see our restaurant on there even though we shouldn't be. I show the owner of the place and in two minutes we are removed from the site as we should have been the entire time. Literally the most annoying thing I've dealt with and 75% of my customers are creepy old dudes. Ugh. Edit. I do not have any hate for dashers. I've never been rude to a delivery driver and I have no clue how the app slash company works. Sorry. I know we all get paid like crap and rely on our tips to get by. I simply wanted to vent about an experience I had. If I was a jerk to everyone for no reason, I wouldn't be in customer service. My mother is holding my money hostage until I talk to her. I've made a post on here previously about how entitled and selfish my mother is. Since that post, numerous people have messaged and commented that I should cut ties with my mother. I'd honestly considered it for a long time, but always made excuses to not do it. After months of thinking it over, I had a handful of reasons to keep contact with her and a mountain of pain that she's caused over the years, so I decided to cut her out of my life. It's been four months now and I feel great. I didn't think it would create such a difference in my life, but oh my god. The thought of not having to hear her southern fake sweet grandma voice make hateful comments about my friends or lecture me about wasting my life because I didn't live up to her wishes makes me so elated beyond words. The only time it's not great is when I have my sisters message me saying, so mom did this, shocker, and we all get upset over her new levels of entitlement and stupidity. 
Her current stupidity has us all upset for different reasons. My mom never told her brother or father that I cut her out. She probably didn't want to look like she failed at parenting, especially since she's the only one of her siblings to have ever had kids. So when they sent the Christmas money to her and said to divide it among us four girls, including me, she never corrected them. Warning, math will be found in the next paragraph. Apologies, but it is accurate and important. Instead, she messaged my sisters and me, but I have her blocked and asked them what they wanted for Christmas. We all know her game. Each family member sends $100 per kid. Four kids with three gifts each means a total of $1,200 in her bank account. She never gave us the full amount of that money, ever. What she would do is ask us what we wanted and either buy the cheapest version of it or buy what she thought we needed slash would like and never spend more than $20 per kid. Meaning she was given $1,200, spent 80 or less and kept $1,120 or more every year. That woman is still in debt somehow. My sisters and I figured this out years ago and reasoned that while we were all small kids under her roof, that's fine. You need to house us, feed us, clothe us. Kids are expensive. But when we turned 16 and were made to get a job and pay for our own phone bill, car payment, car insurance, groceries, clothes, etc. Yeah, no. Give me my money. So when she asks, what do you girls want for Christmas? They responded like we have every year cash. She apparently tried to argue that 2020 has been hard for her and that she couldn't afford to give much this year. My sisters fired back with, that's cool. What did our uncles and grandfathers send you? If you don't remember, we can just call them and ask. That got her to begrudgingly admit what they had sent and say it'll be deposited into their accounts soon. Then she ended it by saying that she wasn't going to send me my money. She was going to just hold on to it until I spoke to her again. My older sister blew up at her for this. Point blank told her that she was either being manipulative so that I would talk to her or she was being a thief and trying to pocket someone else's money. My mom tried to ignore her, but my sister wouldn't let up on this. Eventually, my sister messaged me and told me what was going on. I was upset, but not that surprised by this. I had honestly forgotten all about receiving Christmas money. I expected a card or something, but was just going to send it back to them anyway, like I never received it. So really, she could have sent me a check, and when I sent it back, she could have just pocketed it then. Would have saved everyone this mess. Realizing that, when my sister asked what I wanted to do about this, I told her that while the money would be helpful, because 2020 has been hard financially, if she could somehow get the money from our mom, then to just split it among her and my other sisters. I don't have a relationship with those family members anymore, and taking money from them, even meant as a gift, seems wrong. My sister said she understood and would pass the message along. But oh my god, I'm still upset that my mom is doing this. I feel like she's not trying to be a thief here, but more a manipulator. When I cut ties with her and said my goodbyes in an email, she replied by saying that she would respect my wishes, but also told a story of how she cut out her mom when I was just a little kid, and months later her mom shows up unannounced to my birthday party, and while they didn't speak during the party, they did talk afterwards, she reconciled and were very close until the day her mother passed. I felt like that story was a giant red flag saying, I'll show up in your life when I want to and you'll have to talk to me. Then you'll forgive me and we'll be mummy and daughter again. Heck no. Any attempts to manipulate me into talking to her is messed up and will not work. I feel like this is just the first of many attempts to come, but until I see a hard change in her, I refuse to let her back into my life. Sorry for the incredibly long story. Wanted to post it here because reading a lot of these entitled parent stories are what helped me see how truly toxic my mother is because she is so similar to the Karens in most of these stories. If you have a toxic parent, then please know that you can cut them out of your life and you should not let them back in unless you feel ready to. Don't let them pull petty mess like this to make you talk to them. It's messed up and giving them what they want will only encourage their poor behavior. Have you ever had someone try to use money to manipulate you into doing something you didn't want to? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I'm going to use money to manipulate you to smash that like button. Am I the jerk for not letting my girlfriend's family know that I spoke Spanish? I'm 24, male, not Hispanic or anything. I'm white and was adopted by my parents when I was 5. My mom is Mexican, so I learned Spanish from her. I'm pretty fluent and I guess that surprises people sometimes because I don't look the part. White, blonde hair, blue eyes, etc. Anyways, 
I've been with my girlfriend for a while, who is Hispanic. Never mentioned I'm bilingual because the topic was just never brought up. A month ago, her family wanted to meet me since we recently moved in together. We did it through Zoom, safety and all. It was her parents, her grandma because she lives with her parents, and her sister. Everyone was welcoming and nice. Her grandma was the first to say something in Spanish and her words surprised me because she was literally so nice talking to me and suddenly switched to saying something else. ¿Por qué otro cuero? Why another white boy pretty much. Then she asked when can she set her up with one of her friend's nephews. My girlfriend told her to stop, then her parents did the same. A couple times during the convo, they switched to Spanish whenever making a comment about me. My girlfriend at least always shut down their criticisms and told them to stop talking like that. To be honest, I didn't say anything because I was curious what their real thoughts on me were. It kind of sucked that they were so freely talking about me right in my face. I finally said something when her mom mentioned my girlfriend told her I was in college and asked what I'm studying. Her dad commented to her grandma in Spanish, Ah, no wonder he moved in with her if he's wasting all his money in school. See, the fact that we moved in together seems to be their hang-up with me. They're not happy we moved in and think because she works full-time and I work part-time that we did it so I can mooch off of her, which isn't even true because we split the bills for everything. So I answered in Spanish. We moved in together because we wanted to take the next step in our relationship and we love each other. Then I answered her mom's question. Also added that I have several scholarships that pay for everything, so what I earn goes to living expenses. They all looked panicked and right away apologized a million times for what they said. My girlfriend was shocked too, but she didn't have an issue with what I did and thought the look on their faces was hilarious. She only felt bad that I did know what they were saying all along and apologized. Her sister is telling us that what I did was petty and mean because I embarrassed them, that I should have said I knew Spanish because that was a conversation I wasn't meant to understand or be part of. Therefore, it wasn't my business to listen in. It's like I was eavesdropping to her. I get eavesdropping is bad, and they wouldn't have said anything if they knew I understood, so I guess I can see where she's coming from. Was I the jerk for not saying anything? Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk for not letting them know he spoke Spanish or not? Please let us know. Mm, tell that grandmother I said to Kayate. Karen demands free food when I ask her to leave the restaurant. Here's some backstory. I work at a Chick-fil-A and had recently got promoted to team leader, manager, at the time this happened. Cast. We've got me, Jack. We've got entitled person. And we've got the employee, Ben. I was helping bag food because we were very busy and understaffed when I noticed a lady walk in with two laptops and a briefcase. She walked directly to the dining room, which was strange because we have it laid out so you must walk past when you order to get there. I didn't think much of it and kept working. An hour and a half later, Ben, who had been working dining room, walked up to me. Ben. Hey, Jack, I've been receiving complaints about a lady in the dining room. Me. About what? Ben. She's been telling people to shut up and has taken the largest table in the dining room for what seems like a business meeting. Me. Let me go talk to her. I walk over to the table and there she is. She had two laptops, one with a Zoom meeting and another with a spreadsheet. She has papers covering the table. Me. Excuse me, ma'am. Karen, talking to people in Zoom. Give me one second. Mutes her mic. What do you want? I'm in a meeting if you can't tell. Me. We've been receiving complaints that you've been telling other customers to shut up. Is this true? Yes. They were talking, even though I'm obviously in a meeting. Me. Well, this is a restaurant, ma'am, and I can't have you talking to other customers this way. Could you please leave them alone? No. This is very important and I need them to be quiet. Me. Well then, ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. No. I noticed that the playroom is empty. Why don't I just go in there? Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we're using that as a break room. I don't care. I'm going in there. Go get me some food as well, because you've been treating me terrible. Me. I was getting fed up at this point. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I'm going to have to ask you to leave again. No. I'm going to the playroom, and you are going to give me free food. Me. If you don't leave, I'm going to contact the authorities. What are they going to do? Arrest me? I didn't do anything wrong. At this point, I was done. So I just walked away and called the police and told them what happened. They came and took care of it. This was my first entitled person story I've been unfortunate enough to experience. I hope you enjoyed.
Speaking of Chick-fil-A, do you like Chick-fil-A or not? Please let us know. They're a little pricey for my taste, but that sauce is delicious. Mm, yes. Am I the jerk for refusing to use my son's emergency fund to pay for my wife's dad's surgery? I'm male, 37, and my son, who's 9 years old, has CHD. We knew my son had a problem since my ex-wife was pregnant with him. He had an enormous procedure on his heart when he was 10 days old. We had a huge responsibility of making sure he was recovering and the only people we talked to at the time were surgeons, pediatricians, and cardiologists. I didn't get to spend much time with him. Missed a lot of great moments together because of his condition, but all that didn't matter. I just wanted him to grow up and be healthy, just like any other normal kid. He's 9 years old, visits the doctors every week, and we're still dealing with issues. Every once in a while, there seems to be an issue coming back unexpectedly. Now we're dealing with arrhythmia, and it's terrifying because I really don't know where this is going. I have saved up money for him in case of an emergency. My current wife, who I met in 2018, has been supportive, even though she complains her salary isn't enough. She works at a salon. Unfortunately, my father-in-law hasn't been doing well. He too has a chronic condition and it got worse lately. My wife's family started contacting us about a week ago wanting us to help them with money for his surgery. My wife was the one who talked to her brother, then she came to tell me that we needed to pay money to help her family. Thing is, my salary and hers barely covers for our expenses and daily needs. She brought up the money I have saved up for my son and suggested we use some of it to help her family. She got mad when I said the money wasn't going anywhere and that my son is sick too and he's a priority to me and should be to her as well. She said she was pressured by her brother who kept calling her and asking her to pay. I told her that it wasn't my problem. It's my responsibility as a parent to worry about what the future might hold for my son and be prepared. She got upset. She took it as I didn't care about her dad and how he's the only parent she has left. Trust me, I understand completely, but my son is my priority. He's literally dependent on me and I need to make sure I'm there for him. I've had a lot of people close the door in my face when I was begging for money to pay for my son's hospital stays and I can't let this happen again. She said that I worry too much and need therapy to deal with my issues, but I told her to stop asking because it was final. She wants to invite her brother to come talk to me and explain the situation, but if he shows up, I'll let him know that I'm not obligated to pay since I already am dealing with my own son's issues that keep coming up until now. I understand that my wife's family is my family and they're decent folks and don't deserve this, but my son is my priority. Well, who do you agree with, OP or his wife? Please let us know. Father of the year right here. Thank you for looking out for your son and not giving in to the pressure of your wife. You want copies? You get copies. I like computers. I learned Java and how to set up computers, but I'm largely self-taught with no professional computing qualifications. And while I don't work with them professionally, I like to mess around with computers in my spare time. Many years ago, I worked for a small business that employed around 40 or 50 people. One day, one of the managers reported that her computer had locked up completely and stopped working. The boss gets a technician to take a look at it, who tells him the problem is beyond his ability to solve. He calls an expert who comes in, checks it over, and says it'll make a good doorstop, but nothing else. The boss isn't happy because nothing on this computer has been backed up, and there are some really useful, vital files on it. I hear all about it and suggest that maybe I could have a look. The boss tells me the expert declared it dead, so knock yourself out and expects nothing out of it. I took it home, pulled out the hard drive, slaved it to my computer, ran some recovery software, and hey, presto, started pulling out files. Yay me. I contacted the boss after I'd run it, telling him I had successfully recovered some 97% of the lost files, including some videos. I asked him if he wanted just one main copy and a backup, and he says he wants extra copies for other managers so that the data is backed up on more computers and he'll pay for the cost and for my time in making the copies. I tell him that the videos probably should not be distributed, but before I can explain, he says, I don't care why, I want them distributed. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, you're the boss. Multiple copies are made. Multiple copies are distributed. I handed him his copy in person. I then told him that I thought the videos were not appropriate for distribution and wanted to talk to him about them. Okay, he said, what's the problem? I had to explain that these videos were added prior to the date that the current manager, whose computer they were on, started working for the company, so logically they were not her fault, but the fault of her predecessor. 
The boss said that it sounded serious and wanted to know what the videos contained. I asked to talk to him more privately and, having done so, told him that it was naughty stuff if you know what I mean. Copies which had been distributed on his instructions. He got the copies recalled in record time and asked me to redo them without any video content. He paid me again for doing so. The icing on the cake was the discovery that, apparently, it was originally his computer. Am I the jerk for making sure we can't become foster parents? Backstory. I met my husband 14 years ago. We're both 38, and we agreed to have three to four kids. If there was a fourth, we'd adopt internationally. After our second kid was born, his family started guilting him about how much focus and attention our kids took. His three stepsisters slash sisters are single moms. Dad's not in the picture. In my opinion, these men suck at life, but the sisters consciously chose very poorly. We were generous enough for a year to let his stepsister and her three poorly behaved kids live with us. It resulted in my giving him an ultimatum. Choose which family he wanted to be a father to. She got 60 days notice and referrals to job leads. This was four years ago and she still complains about the injustice. I was not able to love her kids near what I do for my own. I felt pressured to. In fact, I went from really loving her kids to feeling sometimes resentment, usually nothing at all towards them. I really hate how stepsister-in-law felt entitled to get me and my husband to provide for her kids. She's pregnant again and crying about rent. My kid's relationship with their aunt and cousins is badly damaged as well. This past two years, my husband kept coming up with excuses not to be intimate or why I needed to work on XYZ before having another baby. It was stuff like get in better shape, get a promotion because my six-figure salary is insufficient, etc. I crushed those goals and then he kept moving the bar. He now tells me he feels called, manipulated, to foster and tried to start that conversation with an acquaintance of ours who works for the system. She was very excited, but I told her the truth. I don't feel I have the emotional capacity to be a temporary parent or deal with the system's drama. She agreed with me that the system is a roller coaster. Based on the experience with stepsister-in-law living with us, I don't feel I'd be able to treat each child equally emotionally. I feel cheated out of my third kid and don't see myself not being resentful towards my husband anytime soon and I feel I'd resent the foster child too. I also told her that I feel like my husband has a poor sense of personal boundaries. I feel like his minister is guilting slash manipulating him based on our race and high income and might not enforce them with the birth family and that I just didn't see it being a healthy or positive situation for anyone concerned. Our acquaintance said some stuff about praying for me, ended the conversation hurriedly. She apparently messaged my husband later that day to tell him she couldn't, in good conscience, place a foster child with us. Now the narrative is that I'm denying vulnerable kids out of a loving home. Personally, I don't feel like this is something I should do or be expected to do if my heart's not in it. But the fact is that we have the material, not emotional, to provide. I'm going to say here that of the dozens of people calling me evil, none of them are lining up to foster kids. Who's the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or not? Please let us know. Not at all. She sounds pretty stressed out though. Wish I could take her out for a latte. Boss doesn't want my help unless she specifically asks for it. A few years ago, I took a customer service job and my boss, Shirley, was the laziest, snarkiest person I've ever worked around. She spent her days on social media and personal calls while her inbox grew. Shirley's boss rarely came around and was happy as long as Shirley didn't bring any problems to her. So of course, Shirley didn't. She buried any problems. After I had been there a couple weeks, Shirley was showing us some new procedure. I don't even remember what it was, but it was something I had done in a previous position and there was a much easier way of doing it. I asked if I could make a suggestion. Shirley instantly shot it down. No, I don't want suggestions or help unless I specifically ask for them. Just do what I tell you to do. It was embarrassing and demeaning to say the least. When Shirley went to lunch, the gal who had been training me asked me what I was going to suggest and I showed her. She agreed it was much more efficient and she showed the others. She told me they just worked around Shirley. They all disliked her and just waited until she was away to discuss problems and came up with solutions and left Shirley out of it. A year later, the lady who trained me retired. Before she left, she showed me how to run phone statistics reports. They showed how many calls each rep took, how long the calls lasted, how many rings before each call was answered, typical call center stuff. She asked me to take over putting together a report. 
including email statistics each month to send to the e-commerce manager. Shirley was to give me the email statistics. After the first month, I emailed Shirley asking for the email stats. She ignored it. After the second month, same thing. I decided if it wasn't important to her, then I just wouldn't do it. I figured if questioned, I would show the emails I sent Shirley reminding her so I would be covered. Nothing ever came of it. So things went for the next couple of years. Then came the announcement that Shirley's boss had been fired, and while they searched for a replacement, Shirley would be reporting to the president of the company. She was terrified. He had her jumping through hoops. He had her submitting reports to him, attending meetings, answering questions. She returned from one meeting frantic. She told the senior rep, Angela, that she wanted her to bring him phone statistics that afternoon, and she had no idea where to get them. Hmm, I knew. Angela knew I knew. While Shirley sat at her desk trying to figure out what to do, Angela came to me and said, You aren't going to tell her, right? I said, Well, she once told me she didn't want my help unless she specifically asked for it, right? Well, she hasn't specifically asked me. We grinned at each other. Shirley went to her meeting empty-handed. She ended up getting fired a week or so later. I don't think it was because she didn't have the phone statistics, but that was probably one of many things that made it apparent that she didn't know what she was doing. Have you ever had a boss who was just a complete idiot? If so, what did they do? Please let us know. Does an idiot co-host count? You sure got a big head for someone with such a small brain, Mr. Reddit. Am I the jerk for tossing uninvited guests out of our guest house? My husband and I are retired, living here in Costa Rica. We're not rich, we're not poor. We're merely comfortably retired after many years working and saving. Things are also much cheaper here. We could not live like this in the States. Before Thanksgiving, my husband met a man who told my husband he was a personal trainer, wanting my husband to hire him. Husband came home and told me he's hiring this guy who I'm going to call Jose. I shrugged and said okay. He struggled with his weight for years. Skinny or chunky, I love him anyways. I keep telling him to be happy about his body and work gradually, but his personality is it's all or nothing and sets him up spectacularly for failure. Day one with the trainer Jose. Jose shows up and proclaims that hubby needs fruit smoothies and yoga to lose his weight. Very long story short, I emerge and my large kitchen is trashed. I mean cut up peels and fruit pieces everywhere. Half my industrial sized bottle of raw honey was gone and so was the last of our sugar. So he's feeding my husband a drink that would send a diabetic into a coma. Every towel in the house was now dirty and on the floor. Outside was trashed too. I saw red. I have mast cell disorder, and I have good days and bad days. I don't need this type of workload thrown on me, particularly since the start of lockdown means the lady that comes in twice a week to help me out with the cleaning is now back in Nicaragua. And all the cleaning falls on me now, including some I am not supposed to do according to my doctor, like dusting and sweeping. My husband bounces in all happy and says that the trainer is moving in with us for the next month and Jose will train him for free in exchange for rent. I immediately say no, telling him I'm not comfortable with Jose moving in because husband just met him. Could be a criminal or a scammer for all we know. He tells Jose I'm the big meanie and would not let him move in. I'm okay with being thought of as the jerk in this situation. Jose moves in a week and a half later after telling a tale of having to go to his brother the next day that makes no sense. That one short overnight stay morphs into a week that includes staying up all night drinking and playing loud music and keeping the lights on, breaking the washer, dryer, Roomba, and other small appliances in the guest house, coming up with schemes like filming a yoga video at our house, wanting to teach a huge yoga class to strangers at our house, asking for more and more money after having received 500 bucks for training, stealing plants from neighbors to re-landscape our yard, and all sorts of assorted nonsense. That week's stay was supposed to be one night, I lost my temper and angrily threw him out. Now my husband says I'm the jerk for not giving him a chance. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for throwing out Jose or not? Please let us know. Perhaps you should throw out your husband too while you're at it. He sounds almost as goofy as Reddit boy over here. Please don't ask your server to surprise you with a meal. You're a grown adult. Order your own food. This is a story from a few years ago, but is still one of my favorites. I work in a small town restaurant. There was only one other restaurant in the town at the time, so lunchtime would get pretty busy with local farmers, local oil rig guys, and other people that worked around town. I had an eight top of oil rig gentlemen from out of state. 
So this particular young gentleman decided he was going to flirt with me from the very beginning. Not even cute flirting, just obnoxious flirting. I also had a boyfriend. I had a full restaurant and other stuff to attain to, so I didn't have time to sit around and flirt, nor did I want to. The time comes to order food. Everybody else in the group is real straightforward, easy, nice. I get to him and he says, Well, I don't know what I want, sweet pea. Why don't you surprise me? Wink. I hate when people do this. You're a grown adult. You should know what you want to eat. I don't know a single thing about you other than you're cringeworthy. I try asking him to at least narrow it down for me and he won't. So after making sure he doesn't have any food allergies, I give in and agree. What did I order for him? The spiciest pasta on the menu. I did ask him if he liked spicy and his response was, I do if you do. Cringe. Being a small town restaurant, 90% of our menu was made from scratch. So I made sure to tell the cook that cooked his pasta to make it extra spicy because of above reasons. The cook gladly added extra chipotles, jalapenos, and habaneros. I bring out the food, let them all dig in. I check back after 5 minutes asking how everything is. Everyone, except for homeboy, said it was great. Homeboy couldn't answer because he was too busy holding back tears from how spicy it was. I leave and hear all of his buddies burst out laughing and say he deserved it. Another guy ended up paying for his meal and tipping me well over 20%. So in the end it worked out, and good lord did it feel good to finally give someone what they deserved and asked for. No, I am not staff, and no, you can't crash my dad's wedding. About a year ago, my dad was getting married. As it was his second wedding, he did not want it to be a huge event and neither did his fiance. Thus, they decided to have their wedding with just 17 guests at the bookstore where they met. Aw, it was cute, and I wanted to throw up. He asked me and my sisters to guide the other guests to the room where the ceremony would be held since we were there early to set up. The bookstore was something of a maze, as bookstores often are. My dad's wedding was being held on the second floor, so my sisters and I were stationed at various places on the first floor leading to the stairs, which were hidden in a little corner in the back. My sisters and I were dressed up, but not wearing name tags or aprons like the people who actually worked at the bookstore. That did not stop a parade of people stopping by and asking where to find certain books. I don't know what it was about my appearance in particular, but most customers came to me instead of my sisters. I get that I was standing in a particular spot and that I could have looked like I was there to answer questions, but the staff were busy shelving books, dusting, making coffee, and generally being busy, so I would have been a pretty lousy staff member just standing around like that. One customer in particular approached me and asked if I knew where the painting that used to hang in the store was now. I answered that I did not work here and was simply guiding guests to the room where my dad's wedding was to be held. The man looked incredulous and asked me several more questions about the painting, including who the artist was, where the medium was, the size of the painting, and what the subject was. After I answered that I did not know any of those things, he was satisfied that I did not in fact work at the bookstore. He then proceeded to say how much he loved weddings, no matter who was getting married. He asked where the wedding was being held and if he could go take a peek. I answered that that would be really weird given that it's a private ceremony and my dad would probably appreciate it if he didn't. He laughed it off and said, Ah, oh, well, I'll come by and crash the wedding later. I just love weddings so much. I practically begged him to not crash my dad's wedding even just to watch because there were so few guests that it would just be painfully awkward to have some random man smiling in the back. After a few moments of us going back and forth and him promising he'd be there whether we liked it or not, he finally agreed to leave the wedding alone. He stayed for a suspiciously long time in the bookstore, watching all the guests come in. He smiled ridiculously as my now stepmother walked in with her dress and headed upstairs, provoking her to ask me and my sisters, who is that creepy smiling guy standing around watching the entourage? We responded, he's just some guy who really likes weddings, and asked if he could crash yours. To our great relief, he did not show up at the ceremony, but the whole time I was worried about it. Sorry for being distracted during your wedding, dad. Karen really wanted some chicken thighs. I had to go out shopping today. Nothing big, just some groceries I needed last minute. I went to Wally World first, then to a local grocery store for the rest. I go to this store for all my meat because they have butchers and all of the meat and seafood is fresh. Anyway, I picked up two small packages of skinless chicken thighs 
as I have a recipe I've been wanting to try and a whole chicken for Christmas dinner. As I was walking away, I heard someone say, Excuse me? Excuse me? I didn't think whomever it was was talking to me. The store was pretty crowded, so I just kept walking. Then I felt someone pinch my neck. Not like a small pinch. This woman full on, like got as much of my flesh as she could just between her bony fingers and twisted. I nearly screamed. I said, excuse me. I turned around looking at her like, what the heck? This lady had a full basket of food, soda and other junk. She had on her mask, but I could tell she was scowling at me behind it. I'm sorry, but you took the last package of chicken thighs and I was about to get them. Now I'm fighting the urge to lose it on her. Who the heck pinches a stranger? I bit my tongue while she continued to tell me about her dinner plans, then says, Do you mind giving them to me? I got three boys at home and I need to go. I simply say no. I got them first and one of the butchers at the counter might be able to help her. I was about to walk away when she pushed her cart against mine. I don't have time for that. I need to get home and cook. Give them here. You can get something else. At this point, I just wanted to get away from her. Again, I tell her no and push her away to get the last couple of things I needed. I thought that was the end of it. Not even close. I'm looking at Milk when she full on rams her shopping cart into my leg. Like I think she got a running start and slammed it into my leg. Side note, my left knee is dislocated. I can walk on it, but it's painful and right now I can't afford the time off for surgery. My doctor put me in a brace that helps me get around until I get the surgery. She hit me on my left leg. My knee just gave out and I hit the floor, crying in pain. This woman didn't even blink. I saw her reach into my cart, take my chicken and walk away as if she did nothing wrong. Thankfully, more than enough people had seen what she had done. A couple helped me up while someone else got help. I was crying and sobbing, the pain so intense. As employees brought a wheelchair for me, others were asking if I was okay and some customers even ran after the woman. She was stopped at the checkout by a manager who returned my chicken to me while the woman ranted and raved that she had a family to feed and I could have just given her the chicken cause it's Christmas. Eventually I checked out. A couple employees were kind enough to help me to my car and even load up my groceries. The manager asked if I wanted to call the police or press charges but I just wanted to get home. He gave me some coupons, apologized and said they would deal with the woman. I called my brother-in-law on the way home. He met me at my apartment, helped me inside, and unloaded everything for me. As of right now, I'm sitting on my couch with a very red and swollen knee. I have taken my anti-inflammatory medication, got it elevated, and put some ice on it. Definitely going to need to see my doctor tomorrow though, because the pain is coming in waves at this point. She could have seriously injured me. Over two packs of chicken. Edit. So the store did call the police, but I was gone by the time they got there. An officer contacted me. I got a meeting set up at the station tomorrow after my doctor's appointment. The officer informed me she was questioned and released, not arrested. They do want me to file a formal complaint in order to have her arrested for assault. I promise I'm okay. The swelling has gone down some and I'm on some painkillers. I'll make it until tomorrow. Another quick update. Thanks for the rewards and words of support. Promise I'm going to the police station tomorrow after I see my doctor. I will be pressing charges against her. Speaking of chicken. What's your favorite place to get fried chicken from? Please let us know. KFC extra crispy for the win. Mm, yeah. The problem child and the PTA parent. I had to switch high schools my senior year, so I was just finding my footing with a lot of people who had known one another since kindergarten, since the school itself was attended solely by the kids of one small town. I first remember seeing Betty, not her real name, doing something she was apparently famous for, running into people and not stopping. Let me describe this for the full effect. Betty had a habit of expecting everyone and everything to move for her. So if she was walking down the hall and you were at your locker, she would ram into you full force, stumble back and then immediately do it again and again and again until whatever she was running into moved or she tripped over it. So if you were at your locker and she ran into you, you had to move or she would just keep repeating the same action even going so far as to ram into the locker door until she could get through. She even went so far as to step on you if you fell to the floor during this. She never apologized and honestly, I wasn't at all shocked because her expression never changed and it really looked like someone just left a game running with a drifting controller and the character was just wandering in that direction. 
Nothing anyone said or did during these moments even registered on her face or her eyes or even her life because if you confronted her about it, she would look at you like you were crazy and act like it never happened. No one thought this was even a lie because it was clear she genuinely believed nothing happened. I learned from the rest of the school year over time that she had always been like this and if anything, she was worse when she was younger. The other students knew she was not very smart and should by rights have failed every single class she had ever been in. But her mother was head of the PTA since her oldest daughter was born, so she was just moved along every year. And God forbid any teachers try to bring attention to her grades or complete lack of attention span or they would be fired. Maybe it was because I was new or maybe it was because I seemed an easy target, but it took no time for Betty to cling to me and for every teacher to encourage it because it meant less work for them. It was honestly a nightmare. She was everywhere I was, and they even switched my gym period around to be with her because, and I quote, someone needs to help her change before and after gym. That was a big nope for me, and I made sure to basically run out the door the second gym was over and change my clothes in a random bathroom because they could not punish me for not helping her, and frankly, there should have been no reason to help in the first place. It was like this weird game of chicken was going on with Betty's mother and the rest of the school faculty. She couldn't admit her daughter wasn't really fit to be in that school in any way because she was already on thin ice for reasons that are not really important to the story. But at the same time, it was immensely clear Betty needed help well beyond the teacher's pay grade for a public high school in a small town in the middle of nowhere. So they were at a stalemate. The teachers kept passing her and the mother didn't push too hard about weird things like helping her get changed and would instead just show up at the school and do it herself multiple times a day for various things like eating lunch with Betty and making sure she was using the bathroom correctly. Now at this point, I'm sure you're thinking that she was developmentally disabled in some way and counseling and therapy were needed. That may be true, but it was from nurture and not nature from what I was told and from what I experienced. I was informed that Betty actually had two older siblings, both about 10 years older, who were basically angels on earth. These two, a boy and a girl, were so kind and so sweet, butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. But they both seemed to be afraid of their mother and Betty, and a lot of their hard work and high scholastic achievements were based solely on graduating and moving away as soon as humanly possible from their mother and Betty. Apparently, Betty was a miracle baby, conceived well after medical science would have said it was no longer possible, and Betty's mother went bananas after her. She became obsessed and did literally everything for Betty and just never let her grow up. She was never punished, never learned how to problem solve, and never learned how to think independently because why would she need any of that when mommy was here to do all those boring things for her? Add all of that with the mother's place in the PTA and Betty had never done homework or taken a test of any kind at any point in her 12 years of school. Her mother had done all of it. She had also pumped Betty full to the brim with unwarranted praise and adoration to the point where Betty actually believed it. Betty, the person who had never done anything involving school except be in the building and sit still during class, full on believed she was a genius. She also believed she was better and prettier than every other human being on the planet and thought the reason she had no friends was actually envy. She full on believed everyone was just so upset they weren't as smart and pretty as her and they decided the only way to live with their own mediocrity was to full on ignore her. Now, at this point, you might feel a little bad for Betty. I would have too. But then, then she opened her mouth and the amount of toxicity and venom that spewed forth was strong enough that I'm still shocked the EPA didn't show up and encase her in a glass dome labeled toxic waste dump. She was hateful, arrogant, self-centered, apathetic, and cruel. But that is all just a setup for the thing that finally broke Betty's mother and yeeted Betty out of the school forever, the senior play. Now, the senior play was a big deal at this school. Only seniors could be in it and everyone else was stagehands and lighting. Betty not only wanted to be in it, she wanted to be the star. Here's the thing though, Betty could not act, could not take any sort of direction and was functionally illiterate thanks to her mother never letting anyone teach her to read. Betty's mother decided that, because of this, she was going to basically co-direct the play, and by that I mean stand next to Betty and repeat all her lines to her over and over again while moving her around the stage physically. It took less than a week for the actual director, a teacher who was retiring in less than three months and could not give less of a hoot anymore, 
to throw his hands in the air and say this was clearly not going to work out and that Betty needed a role with way fewer lines and much less stage time. The mother actually agreed to this. Everyone's guess was out of sheer exhaustion, but was not willing to be the bad guy and tell her precious little NPC no. So she scuffled off to the bathroom while the director broke the news. Betty lost her mind. She immediately became very violent and started trashing the stage, screaming at the top of her lungs. When the director tried to get her to stop, she, and this was all verified by no less than five different stagehands and directors, tackled this old man to the ground and bit him. She bit him so hard she drew blood. The director was trying to get her to let go, but she was just digging her teeth into his arm and clamping down for all she was worth. I honestly don't think she had ever worked as hard at anything else in her entire life before or since as she did trying to take a chunk out of the director's arm. At this point, her mother ran back in. My guess, alerted by the sudden screaming of the director and lack of screaming from Betty, and spent a good hot minute trying to pry Betty's jaws open and get her off the director's arm. She was dragged away by her mother. The director was in a sling with bandages all over his arm for a while and no one ever saw Betty again. Word got out that Betty's mother tried to play the whole thing off as it somehow being the director's fault for upsetting Betty and getting in her way by trying to stop her from destroying everything on stage that the students had worked so hard on. This was different though. This was assault and Betty was already 18 so mommy couldn't save her this time. It was decided behind closed doors that Betty would never return and just be mailed her diploma and in exchange no charges would be pressed. That was the last time I ever saw or heard of Betty. But from what I understand, she still lives with her elderly mother to this day and it has sucked the soul right out of that woman. I'd feel bad for her, but she made Betty into who and what she is today so she can live with it. Speaking of plays, have you ever been in any sort of play? And if so, what was your role? Please let us know. I played the lead role in the Karen of the Opera. It was marvelous. Yes, I'm going to talk to you like that. I made the mistake yesterday of being slightly disappointed that I hadn't anything crazy or weird to share recently. This was my punishment. I put up the sign by the night window saying I'd be back in a minute and headed to the bathroom. When housekeeping is here, we leave the lobby door unlocked so they can come and go easily. This normally isn't a problem as there is a large do not enter sign on the door. Another saying employees only check in at night window and a big arrow pointing at said night window. From time to time, someone will come in, but always step out again upon being corrected without issue. The housekeepers were on lunch in the breakfast room, so I didn't really worry about leaving the lobby unattended. A moment later, from the bathroom, I hear a commotion in the lobby and some unfamiliar voices. I finish up quick and step out. The head housekeeper is waiting for me and tells me that some people came into the lobby and won't leave. Awesome. I step to the front, and on the couches, surrounded by the boss's dog's toys, is a visibly but not heavily pregnant woman holding a shorted cigarette. Standing next to her is a man holding some shopping bags. Neither are wearing masks. Me. I need you folks to get out of the lobby. It's closed. Normally, I might not be so blunt, but considering they had already argued with the head housekeeper about leaving the lobby, it seemed like a waste of time to start at polite customer service. The guy decided that my tone was going to be the new reason he wouldn't leave. Guy. Excuse me? You're going to talk to me like that? Me. Yes, I'm going to talk to you like that. The lobby is clearly marked as closed and the head housekeeper already told you you need to leave. Then he tried using the woman's pregnancy as an excuse. He was surprised to learn that his girlfriend being pregnant didn't somehow make the rules not apply to them. He tried arguing that it was cold outside and they had a reservation, and yet the lobby was still closed. During the back and forth, they made exactly no effort to start leaving the lobby, and it didn't seem like they intended to. I credit this exclusively to the fact that I'm not terribly intimidating in my adorable cartoon kitten mask. I also decided I definitely didn't want them staying at the hotel. Both were aggressive, and the woman looked and sounded as if she was under the influence of something. I informed them I would not be honoring the reservation because of their behavior, and they needed to leave. If they did not leave, I would call the police to help them leave. What followed will likely be a familiar scenario. They think I'm bluffing and say, go ahead, call the police. They see me call the police, realize I'm not bluffing, and leave the lobby. I hung up before disconnecting to dispatch as it seemed as if they were leaving. I quickly locked the lobby door for security as soon as it shut behind them. Apparently, we weren't done. 
as the girl finally located the night window where they should have been in the first place and started screaming at me to give them their points back. I told her she'd need to contact Breezy Pig for that. She tried arguing with me about it, but like, the only way to get your points back is to go through the brand. There isn't really anything I can do. But she's a dumb jerk, so she kept arguing with me about it anyway. She started calling me fat and rude, and since we were apparently playing the observation game, I called her a toothless jerk. She really didn't appreciate me pointing out the painfully obvious as she had done and decided she was going to try to come back into the lobby and was rattling and banging at the door. At that point, I decided maybe I do need to call the police after all before this nutcase breaks something. I start the call, then she's screaming at me that she's going to record me and it's going to go viral. Her boyfriend is back from wherever he wandered off to and is trying to get her to leave. She also screams at him, something about not giving a hoot. She's going to record me and it will go viral. I deviously foil her plans by stepping into the back room where she can't see me. I hear her run out of steam while I'm in the back on the phone with the dispatcher. When I don't hear her anymore, I poke my head out and check the cameras to find them both gone. I relay this to the dispatcher, but they decide to send an officer over to check it out anyway and see if they're still in the area. While waiting for them, I pull up the reservation so I can pass the information on to the police. I check the woman's name against our DNR spreadsheet and guess who is already there. Under reason, it says, angry about deposit, did not understand basic rules, rude and on drugs. I decide to Google her name. Guess who has a habit of being arrested for trespassing and possession? No wonder her boyfriend wanted her to get moving. Am I the jerk for not agreeing to a name change for my daughter despite her father wanting one? My ex and I were engaged, living together and planning on trying for kids after the wedding. The wedding got delayed and I found out I was pregnant shortly after. My ex freaked out, insisted it couldn't be his baby because he wasn't ready to be a dad, that this was all happening too fast and it wasn't how we planned it and said he needed some time to think everything over. He then moved out, blocked me, and didn't answer any kind of attempted contact for 10 months. Our child was born without him there, and I named our daughter Elizabeth Laura Smith, without his input. Elizabeth, because I like it, and it reminds me of my favorite book character. I work in literature. Laura, after my grandmother, and Smith is my surname. My ex has reached out. He said he waited this long because he wasn't sure how far along I was when we were together, but he figured the baby had to have been born by now. I said that his timing was a little off because she's five months old. X has said he's planning to sort out custody. We've not discussed logistics yet, but he's unlikely to get anything before she turns one. He asked if I'd named her yet, and I told him what I'd named her. X then said he hates that name. He thinks it sounds old and stuffy. He says that as his mother, Mary, has recently passed, November 2019, he wants to name our daughter Mary. He says Mary must be the first name and that I can have either Elizabeth or Laura as the middle name. I made clear in no uncertain terms that I will not change her name. I hate the name Mary. I hate how it sounds, both alone with Elizabeth slash Laura Smith on the end of it. Plus, I didn't like his mother either, though I didn't remind him of that. X said that if we're going to co-parent, then I have to learn to compromise and that this is the place to start and that it's unfair that I got to choose both her first and middle name. I said that if he hadn't blocked me for the better part of a year, he'd have been able to say all of this when she was born. X said that the above is proof that I'm being petty and that he can't undo the past, but I can't prevent any feelings of dislike or resentment from him over this name in the future and that as the father, he should have a say in his daughter's name. He also says that he's willing to let her be a Smith and not force me to use his surname, which he feels is proof he has already negotiated. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Should OP change her baby's name or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. That X sounds like a real piece of work. At closing time, I am still the manager. So I was 19 at the time and a shift supervisor at a local sub shop, Planet Sub. This was my first supervisory slash managerial position and for how shy and generally insecure I was at the time, I am amazed I had the gall to do this. To be fair, it had been a long day and I had a second job that would give me more hours if I wanted. I was in charge of closing the store and I had a couple of staff call in, leaving me and two workers to deal with a busy night of sandwiches and entitled customers and no breaks save for quick restroom ones. The store closed at 10 and we were for sure going to be shutting things down at 10, 
clean as fast as we could, and be free. All of us had school or classes the next day early. Around 9.30, I answered the phone to a terse gentleman demanding to know when we closed because he needed to pick up sandwiches. I told him we shut the doors at 10, so he would have to be quick, and I offered to take his order over the phone so he could just pay when he gets here. He said he would have to look at the menu and rudely asked how he would have any idea what he wanted without seeing the menu. I replied that I had no idea if it was his first or fifth time here. He scoffed, said he would be by soon, before 10. I kept going on about work as we all got the closing and cleaning things done ahead of time that we could. As 10 p.m. neared, I kept glancing out front to see if he was here, but nope. Once 10 p.m. hit, we got going on what we needed to finish. Food covered, stored in the walk-in, counters cleared, etc. There were a few people finishing up eating in the lobby, but they looked almost done. At 10.15, an irate voice called into the kitchen asking, Is there anybody working here? I would like to place my order. I walked out and behind the counter told him that we closed 15 minutes ago and the kitchen was shut down. I called half an hour ago and I was told I could come get the food still, that you were open, he stated. That was me you spoke to, and at 9.30, 45, not 30 minutes ago to be precise, we were open, and I informed you that we closed at 10. It is not 10.15. We are closed, I politely replied. There are people still here eating, so you're clearly open. He gestured to the people putting their coats on and walking towards the door. Politely and with a forced friendly smile, I said. They had put their order in before 10 and just finished. The oven is turned off and the food is put away. I don't care. Make me food, he sputtered. Sir, I cannot do that, I replied. We are closed, everything is put away, and the registers are shut down for the night. We open at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I demand to speak to your manager right now, he hollered. At this moment, folks, I had a moment of clarity that I did not want to take this in the slightest, and I wanted to be a sarcastic and immature jerk. I did not get paid enough for this, and I was fed up with the day. One moment, I will get him. I said politely with a genuine smile. I then turned around, removed my hat and apron, hung them on a hood, and turning back to face him, stated, Hi, I'm Jeff. I am the manager tonight. I heard cackles of laughter from the other employees in the back who had been listening to all of it. I'm calling tomorrow for the store manager, and you will all be fired, he stated as he stormed out. His name is Sean. Have a good night, I shouted after him. He should be here by seven. He turned around at the door. You just lost a very valuable customer. This is the last time I'm coming here. Thank God for that, I said as he stepped out. I then quickly locked the door and made sure he left. I called my manager and he just laughed at it. He was a cool guy. The guy never did come back, but he gave me a delightful memory and story. Would I be the jerk for encouraging my spouse to keep her word about things she said while angry? My sweetheart and I are in our mid-40s and have been together for seven years. She has two kids from her first marriage, 23, male, who we'll call old, and 20, male, who we'll call young. The marriage ended in death. She's a widow. We all live together in the same home. Though we share expenses, we do not share bank accounts. Note, I'm not asking if we're jerks for not sharing bank accounts. Since the start of lockdown, both kids have been staying with us. Neither works or go to school. In the past couple of months, it's like their attitudes and behavior have regressed to when they were 13. When I got home from work on Thursday, the three of them were yelling and screaming. Mom had asked them to help clean up after dinner. Young couldn't help because he promised girlfriend he'd Zoom meet with her. Old couldn't help clean up because he had made plans to go dirt bike riding with his friends. Since then, they've been going at it and in everything or nothing all at once. It came to a head this morning. I woke up to my wife putting her foot down and loudly giving them ultimatums. Below is a list of some of the things that she said. She is done listening to how she's over controlling and goes over the line in helping them manage finances. They're all going to the bank tomorrow morning and they can put their money into accounts with only their names on it. Her exact words. Neither one of you can even balance a checkbook. You both would have been broke six months after turning 18 if I had let you have free reign over the money your father left you. I am done being told I'm a manipulating, over-controlling, coercive witch. You can have complete control of your money, and if you waste it all away in the next six months, that is your problem. Reference the living room. They no longer have permission to lounge all day and night watching nonsense on TV and playing video games. 
The only thing they can watch on TV is educational stuff that meets her approval. Overall, her words. If I ever have to be reminded again that you are over 18 and an adult, it better be with your packed bags in hand while you are on your way out the door. If you don't like me or my rules while you live under my roof, you are free to go wherever the heck it is that you'd rather live. Today was an all-time, never seen before, epic blowout. However, she has touched on most of these things before, only to never follow up on any of them. Would I be the jerk to remind, encourage, and even pressure her to maintain enforcement of these new rules? Well, what do you think? Would OP be a jerk if he reminded his wife about this or not? Please let us know. Go for it, but be careful. She might let you have it next. And I don't work here, lady Christmas kindness story. Background. Yesterday, Western Pennsylvania had the most snow since 2009. My 2016 Corolla had barely passed inspection the day before, so I was planning on getting new tires in the next week and new rotors and pads in January. We were low on milk and diapers and so had a Walmart pickup appointment. It was too late to cancel and I thought I had time to get in and out before the snow got too bad. I was wrong. I slid down a hill and hit an SUV stopped at the bumper, scuffing their bumper and destroying my car. I was able to drive it off the road and park it. I had a wagon in the trunk and decided to still try to pick up my groceries. I checked in on the app in spot 4 and tried to call but it went to voicemail. A minute later someone came up to park in my spot that I was standing in with my wagon. Obviously a man standing in a parking spot in a snowstorm didn't register with him so I moved. As I was standing on the sidewalk, snow swirling, an old lady looked at me like she wanted to ask a question. She rolled down her window and started complaining that no one answered the phone. I gestured to my clothes, no Walmart logo in sight, and said, I don't work here. I tried calling them too and it went to voicemail. I also said that I was waiting myself and had just crashed my car. About 5 minutes later, she asked if I wanted to wait in her car. It was snowing so hard, my wagon was filling with snow, so I said yes. I got in the car and told her that I lived about 5 miles away and planned on walking back with my wagon of groceries. She knew the neighborhood where I lived well foreshadowing, and though she lived in the opposite direction, she offered to drive me and my groceries home in a snowstorm. I said yes. After another 10 minutes, they loaded our groceries in the car and I put my wagon in. On the way to my house, we talked about all kinds of things. Her parents went to the school for the deaf that is about 100 yards from my house and she worked as a sign language interpreter. On the way, she pointed out where she used to live. She told me where her kids lived and how much the neighborhoods had changed. She also talked about how she just canceled cataract surgery due to lockdown and said she really needed it. That made me wonder about the safety of her driving me, but beggars can't be choosers. We made it home safely and I brought my groceries in. My wife brought our three-year-old out to thank her while I brought stuff in, and we gave her a Christmas card. Thanks, Pat from Johnstown. At 88 years old, still my Christmas angel. Am I the jerk for going missing after my crush and best friends started dating? A couple of years ago, I had a crush on this girl since high school and never really did anything, which I know is my own fault, but decided to shoot my shot with her. I got rejected and she ended up dating my best friend who knew I had a crush on her. Whenever they would hang out with our friend group, they would do lots of PDA and stuff like that, which made me uncomfortable and I hate to admit it, but I was jealous as well and at the time hated that they were together. Honestly, I was low key a nice guy. I had nothing really going for me at the time either. I had a job, but it was a dead-end job with no real career goals and wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life, and I knew I had to make a change. One day, I just couldn't stomach it anymore. I blocked them on everything, not just them, but our mutual friends as well, deleted their numbers, and just completely went off the grid, at least to them anyway. I applied to university and got into a paramedics course, which I'm currently in my second year of. I moved to the city where uni was, and really my hometown is only a 75-minute train ride to the city, so not too far at all, and I really started to have a life of my own. I got into weight training, judo, and yoga, and it changed my life. Eventually, I met my now girlfriend in my paramedic course, and she is amazing. I got pretty lucky. Anyway, with everything going on right now, student housing got cancelled, and my parents offered to let me move back in with them until it starts back up again, and I accepted. They said my girlfriend can come too since they like her. Me and my girlfriend were doing shopping for my parents. We were getting a pack of muffins for my dad and I saw them in the same aisle. I hoped they wouldn't see me, but they did. And they came up to me to start a conversation. 
The three of us said hi awkwardly and just made a bit of small talk, introduced them to my girlfriend, etc. I low-key hoped this would be over quickly. I said I was doing shopping for my parents and my former friend said, ah, so you don't go missing on them either. I kinda just did an awkward laugh and I said I was sorry for that, but I just needed my own space to think. He said that apology wasn't good enough and they were really freaking out wondering what happened to me or if they offended me or something. They never asked my parents, since when I was home, I would tell my parents to cover for me if they came around. He said I was a jerk for what I did and that he hated me. My girlfriend asked what that was about and I told her the story here. She said it was a bit of a jerk move but understands my reasoning. But honestly, removing them all was the best thing I did for my life and I don't think I did anything wrong. Am I the jerk? My mother demands I let her stay at me and my girlfriend's house. I'm literally over the moon for the past several hours despite what has happened between me and my mother again. I've made several posts on here about how my mother behaves towards my relationship and my girlfriend, Eva. For those of you who haven't seen them, Eva is of foreign ancestry and has vitiligo, which my mother doesn't like at all, though I find it absolutely beautiful. She has done and said some very hurtful things to break us apart, which, thanks to my incredibly supportive father and many more family members, only led to her having to stay at her sister's, who was pretty much the same as her, until today. Even though my aunt is hateful towards Eva as my mother, unlike my mother, she's not a lazy couch potato, and after some time got fed up with my mother and gave her some time to get out of her apartment, at least that's what I'm told. Because my father wouldn't accept her back home, she tried her luck with me. Despite the fact that she already stayed at me and Eva's place months ago, and it ended up in a huge argument, which had left both me and Eva in tears. So earlier today, my mother appeared at the gate. Great. At first, I thought that maybe she would go away if we pretend to not be at home, but it didn't work. The longer she was standing there, the more she was shouting and hitting the bell. I accepted my fate and went to confront her. Mom. There you are. What were you two doing that took you so long? Me. What do you want? I told you to stay away from us. I told you to get the heck out of our lives. Mom. Well, instead of being at your aunt's, I thought of spending the holiday with you and Eva. I could not believe it. Not only did she have the audacity to come and ask to stay, but she addressed Eva by her name. Not that girl of yours or some hurtful insult. Me. Well, too bad. We're not letting you ruin our Christmas and New Year's. Oh, come on. I'm just trying to get along. Me. That's what we tried when we let you stay last time. And look how that ended. It's not my fault that she's so insolent. Me. She's not. You, however, are. Not only for what you did before, but you have the audacity to come here and demand to stay with us? How dare you? How dare you choose this ugly jerk over... I interrupted her. Me. Over you? Always. How dare you? You shouldn't throw your life away for someone so ugly. There's tons of better people to date. Me. I'm happy with her. Happier than ever. But you still have to be hurtful towards her. Mom. I'm just trying to do what's the best for you. I know what's best for you. Me. If you did what was best for me, you'd leave us alone. I then went inside while my mother was insulting both of us. Me. You're the disgusting one here. I'm just saying what I think of you and doing what I think is right. And I slammed the door shut. She continued with her insults until some neighbors threatened to call the police. Public offense, I assume. Then she left. Later, I called my father, who told me that aunt basically kicked my mother out. Edit. Thank you everyone so much for the kind words, and since I can't do so in person, awards. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I was told by my father that she's staying over at some friend's place. Entitled stepsister convinces my dad to coerce me into buying gifts for her kids. So I'll start this off by saying that although my wife and I are firmly child-free, neither of us hate kids. Generally, if there are kids around and they aren't screaming like banshees, we don't mind them. I also get along relatively well with most of my stepfamily, but my stepsister went full mombi and turned out to be a pretty rotten person overall and messed up the rest of her family a lot, especially where kids are involved. This slow burn starts a full year and a half before my plan came into effect. Earlier in the year, my dad quite sensibly suggested that with the size of our family Christmas party, we skip a generation with gifts to ease the financial strain as the extended family grew. At the time, I was struggling with my business and athletic career, and my wife, then girlfriend, 
was working on her second master's degree, so I suggested names from a hat, but he wanted to spoil all his grandkids. I said fair enough, I'll chip in for Oma's cruise and buy gifts for my step-siblings, but don't expect anything grand. We've got me, 32 years old, at the time, heavyweight mixed martial artist and strength coach, aka small-time athlete working a day job to barely make rent in addition to training full-time. We've got stepsister, 40-ish, an aging mom bee. We've got Thing One, my oldest niece who's 12, stepsister's daughter. Imagine the most vapid teenager stereotype and multiply it by a thousand. We've got Thing Two, my oldest nephew who's nine, the stepsister's son, living proof that you're never too young to be a jerk. We've got Bro, my stepbrother who's 36, formerly a cool dude who gave up on life when his kids were born. Spawn One, my youngest niece who's six, Bro's daughter, sweet and shy girl, terrified by my mere presence, the wisest of the bunch in my humble opinion. And we've got Spawn too, my youngest nephew who's seven, bro's son, a generally nice kid who at this time was part way into evolving into a jerk after being constantly told to look up to and emulate Thing 2. Spawn 1 had brought a Nintendo DS and all the kids are struggling to see or play it, so I foolishly offer to loan them mine to lighten the load. Spawn 1 agrees to share with Thing 1 and Spawn 2 agrees to share with Thing 2. Having stupidly deprived myself of my means to escape social obligations, I go to the living room to acquire that much older cure for not wanting to deal with other people. Alcohol. Not even having had time to pour a dram, my trained ear picks up from the kids' room the unmistakable sound of one human being pummeling another. I politely suggest to bro that he might want to go have a look, but bro hasn't given two craps about anything in seven years, so he waves it off and I go to investigate. I walk in to see that Thing 2 may be a jerk, but he is not untalented and is managing to strike, shove into a wall, and kick Spawn 2 all at the same time while attempting to play my DS with his other hand, having decided his turn began the moment I left the room. Thing 1 has simply wrested the DS from Spawn 1, who is now sitting in the corner crying. I shout for Stepsister, informing her that if she doesn't get in here to break things up before I count to 10, I would have a stern conversation with them. She turns up and separates the kids and I retrieve my DS. Instead of giving Thing 2 a lesson on sharing and not hitting people, she proceeds to lose it on Spawn 2, the one who got beat up, for not simply giving up the DS to her little jerk and making her son look bad. Thing 1 simply lets out a tween age sigh for the ages and tosses the other DS into the crying Spawn 2. I then excuse myself from the party, thanking whatever gods may be that I don't have to provide gifts for any of those little jerks. Six months later, my firm belief in atheism is confirmed as bro calls me and this conversation ensues. Bro. Hey Elbow Smash, while I really appreciated the gifts last year, you should really get something for the kids this year instead. Christmas is all about the children after all. Me. No, I turn off to chat with you and dad and Oma. I really don't give two craps about the kids. Bro. That's a mean thing to say about my kids. Don't you care about them? Me. You cared about them so much that at the last party, you couldn't be bothered to break up a fight where your son was losing. Bro. Thing one is a good kid. Stepsister said he just had a bad day. Me. He was literally beating him up. If thing one were an adult and had that kind of bad day, I'd have had a stern conversation with him and convinced him to peacefully lay on the floor until the police arrived. Bro. Well, stepsister and I were thinking, and we think you should buy stuff for the kids next year instead of us me. Well, I'm happy not to buy you anything, but I'm not getting crap for stepsister's little brats, especially when she encourages that behavior. Bro. Well, if you aren't going to get something for all the kids, then you shouldn't get anything at all. It's not right if you don't treat them equally. Me. Done. Now, I'm sure they wish it had been this simple, but unfortunately it wasn't, and I certainly wouldn't have written such a long-winded story if that were the payoff. Thanks for bearing with me so far. We're almost at the end. A few months later, about two weeks before Xmas, I get an email from my dad with links to various toys, mostly from Toys R Us, which still existed at the time. When I call him back to ask what that's all about, the conversation ensues. Me. Hey, what's up? I got your email. What's that all about? Dad. Those are gifts for the things and spawns for Christmas. Me. That's cool if you're getting them that. I'll see them when the kids open them. Dad. No, that's for you to get them. Me. I don't buy for that generation, remember? And I already sent you my contribution to Oma's cruise. Dad. 
You need to get stuff for the kids. Don't you want them to look up to you as an uncle? Me, not really. Also, what part of my life suggests to you that they ought to look up to me as any sort of a role model? You'd be better off telling them to grow up to be rock stars. Dad, not the point. Christmas is about the children. If you don't get them this stuff, I won't put your name on the card for Oma. Me, that's a crappy thing to do, considering I already paid into that. Dad, will you get the stuff or not? Me, well, guess my name isn't going on the card then. This will cost me more than a month's rent, so you can take this list and grease it up real nice. Dad, interrupting. Calm your jets. This is what they want. Me, I'll get them a token something, but I'm not taking out a loan. Dad, fine, just make it something they enjoy. Me, if what I get doesn't put a giant smile on each and every one of their faces, I'll buy you dinner at a steakhouse of your choosing. Dad, that's the spirit. Talk to you later. So Christmas rolls around, and my wife and I bought not just one, but four gifts for each of the little ones, and wrapped them all beautifully. My dad, correctly, assumes it's all probably from the dollar store, but it's nicely wrapped, and he gives me a look of approval as I place it under the tree. My wife and I schmooze for a bit, and then suggest that since we brought several gifts for each of the kids, why don't they open up one each before dinner so they have something to do while they wait? Their parents, of course, agree, as it gives them more of a reason to ignore their kids and talk about them instead, so they send us off to hand out gifts to their kids, stepsister looking especially smug. As they begin to unwrap them, I prepare the camera as my wife goes for our coats, and I stick around just long enough to immortalize on film the big crap-eating grin on each of the kids' faces as they see what their gift is. Less than one minute later, the first blast from the air horn, Thing 2's gift, can be heard in the hallway, clearly by my wife and I as we make our way to the elevator. I have no idea how much of the bulk pack of Silly String spawn one's gift, or the 36 rainbow pack of off-brand Sharpies spawn two's gift ended up on the walls, but I do know they repainted the place the next month. Whether or not the pile of slap-on bracelets we got for thing one ended up on the wrists and legs of the parents as they tried to contain the other three will be left to the imagination but I like to think they all ended up in the height of 80s fashion before Boxing Day. I may never know if they opened the rest of their presents. Everyone got a copy of each of the other's gifts, you know, for fairness, plus a bunch of gross and mildly inappropriate temporary tattoos. In the confusion, none of them noticed either me or my wife leaving. I'm certain at some point they did notice the pretty gold envelopes addressed to the parents on the tree. Inside was a very pretty card, blank, but for the following note. This was a warning shot from off the top of my head. I've got a whole year to get creative for next time. Merry Christmas, E. I never bought anyone a steak dinner. However, I enjoyed several more Christmases with my Oma and Dad until they passed and I stopped seeing that side of the family at all. No mention of this incident or gifts for the kids was ever made again. Have you ever had to get Christmas gifts for someone who you didn't really want to? If so, what did you get them? Please let us know. I hate getting gifts for you, Mr. Reddit. You're not here to think. Ouch, but okay. About a decade ago, I was the new guy at the company. We have people fly in from all over the world to start putting gear together before leaving again for job sites. And one of the things I did in my earlier days was pick those people up from the airport, take them to their hotel after work, etc. I pick up a guy who's going to be my boss on an upcoming job. The airport is about an hour from our HQ and hotel if you take the highway and main roads. When I meet him at the airport, he makes a request that I follow the directions on this awesome new GPS app that he's got on his phone, swears it finds the absolute fastest routes. I'm paid by the hour and I'm the new guy, so sure, no problem. It ends up taking almost 25% longer than the main roads would have, but I'm not bothered. The next day, I'm asked to take him to his hotel. It's a straight shot a few miles down the road, but the road is always stop and go at rush hour. I make a turn off the road almost immediately in order to take a route that I know is faster and he starts giving me a gentle amount of grief about not listening to his magical GPS app. I get him to the hotel in great time but he still just won't stop insisting that the main road, which we could see was backed up, would have been faster. Okay, fine. A couple of days later, we drive a few hours to our primary job site. The trip is fine. I follow his magic app and we arrive without incident. It's the largest job I've done so far and I admittedly stumbled with a little bit of it. Boss tries to give me a pep talk at the end of day one, but fails miserably. One of the critiques he gave me is, you're not here to think. 
There are engineers on the job and there are techs. I'm just a tech and I'm told I'm basically there to do the grunt work, expect, and just listen to what people like him tell me to do. Pretty demoralizing lecture, honestly, but I take it to heart. Once the event is over, it's my job to take boss man back to the airport, which I'd like to remind you at this point is in the city I live in and not where he's from. We're running a little later than I would prefer to, but he's the kind of guy who would rather get to the airport 15 minutes before his flight boards. And as always, we're using his GPS, which he is still raving about. I don't know if the dude's friend invented the app or something, but he's just seriously fawning over it. Well, we approach what I know is the exit to the airport, but the app says to stay on the highway and take the next exit in a mile or two. So I follow the app, having learned my lesson from the boss, and soon we're stopped dead in a tight, single-lane construction zone. Boss realizes this and starts to panic, and then starts asking me if I'm sure I took the right route. The exit I'd normally take for the airport was a little ways back, but the GPS said to keep going. You went past the exit for the airport? His voice is raised, but not shouting. I went past an exit for the airport, I calmly replied. I'm sure this one will get us there, but with the speed traffic is moving, I don't know if we'll make your flight. It's already a pretty tight connection. He shouted at me this time. What were you thinking? Since the car was stopped dead, I turned my head so I could meet his eyes and very blankly said, I'm not here to think. If Uber had existed there at the time, I think he would have gotten out of the car with his bag and called for a ride. As it is, I spent the rest of the trip listening to him yell at some poor airline agent about getting his flight rebooked since it was at this point that he wasn't going to get there in time. And the thing is, this really wasn't even malicious on my end. I was just too timid to rock the boat anymore. So I was doing things exactly as I was told. Not my fault that it bit him in the butt. Entitled mom thinks she is more deserving than a children's hospital. First time poster, long time lurker. This happened last Wednesday and it's been on my mind ever since. I just don't understand how people can be so awful. I live near a children's hospital in the UK and they do donation drives occasionally to try and get nice things for the kids. My partner and I had just got a new video game console and so our old one was collecting dust. We thought that since it was close to Christmas, why not donate it, do something nice. So we go to the hospital having filled out a form telling us where to hand it in. They're being strict due to lockdown and unfortunately there was a mix up with this form. We had filled it in for a different hospital and weren't allowed to queue to hand it in on that day due to infection control. A bit annoying but never mind, we rebook for the next day and turn to leave. Enter entitled mom. She was behind us and waiting for her own form, so she must have heard our discussion. A few seconds later, she follows us to the car park and called out. Entitled mom. Excuse me, did I hear that you're giving away a console? Me. Yeah, well, we were going to, but we got a bit mixed up. So? Very long and drawn out. You don't need it anymore? Me. Nah, but we're booked in for tomorrow, so it'll be okay. Why don't you give it to me? I could give it to my son for Christmas. Me. Oh, um, sorry, but we wanted to give it to the hospital. Do some good, you know? Are you saying this wouldn't be doing good? She raised her voice out of nowhere. No idea what I said to offend her. We've had a horrible year, and this would be amazing for my son. Fiance stepping in to help. Lots of people have had a bad year. We just feel that the hospital is the best place for it. Why? I'm in need too. It isn't fair to give everything to those kids. My son has been good all year and he deserves it more. Fiance, it's not a competition. We're giving it to the hospital. You're so rude. You should give things to people who need them. If they're in the hospital, they don't need games. It's a stupid idea. Fiance, sorry, like she said, we're booked in for tomorrow. We're going to get our bus now. At this point, he helped usher me away from her. I'm not great with confrontation and she kept calling out to us as we left about how her son was more deserving than the kids in the hospital. How it was rude of us to ignore her. It was pretty awful. Sorry if I'm not great at telling the story. And we did get back the next day to very grateful nurses. So it's a happy ending. Merry Christmas everyone reading. Am I the jerk for making my late wife's daughter move out so I can date in peace? My late wife passed about a year ago. We were together 10 years, but not married until she became sick about a year before that. She has a daughter, Beth, who is 19 years old. Beth is taking college classes, but they are 100% online, so she has stayed at home, which is my house. I've owned this before my wife moved in, 
so it was never technically shared. I've wanted to be supportive of Beth, but I don't want her here indefinitely or until she's done with college. That's three more years and it makes dating super awkward. I had a lady friend over after a dinner date last week and she was making snarky remarks towards her and later told me that I'm moving on too fast. I tried to have an honest talk about being ready to move on and date others, but she kept calling me a jerk. I'm just ready to move on with my life, but her presence is making that difficult. I told her I want her to move out at the end of next semester, which would be the end of May, so five months to find a place. She flipped out and told me I'm abandoning her to get hookups. This isn't really the case. I just want to move on with my life and don't want to live with a 19-year-old anymore. She's still mad at me and is making living in my own home awkward, but she claims she can't afford to go anywhere else. Edit. I did not raise or adopt Beth. My wife was very clear that she was not looking for a replacement father for her. Beth never lived with me until two years ago when she was almost 18 when her mom moved in with me due to her being sick and needing more attention. I never played a fatherly role in her life. Before moving in, she and her mom moved every few years for a while. Beth didn't move in till her senior year of high school because her mom needed my help. Obviously couldn't move the mom in without the daughter. Before giving her notice to leave, I tried to have a talk with her about ground rules for staying here, mostly including being polite to any guests of mine. She then went off on me for moving on with my life. That is when I made my decision. It wasn't exactly your traditional marriage. Before getting sick, my late wife never wanted to get married because her parents had such a nasty one and her parents had been divorced a combined four times. I'm not religious, so never felt a need to get married either. When she got sick, we realized her insurance was terrible while mine through work is much better. So it was a practical decision to get married so she could be added to mine. Even then, she affirmed I wasn't responsible for Beth. I'm not just trying to get hookups like many have said. I'm moving on and trying to have a normal adult relationship. Final response. After this blew up overnight, even though the top comment says you're the jerk, it seems everyone who eventually read all of the details has affirmed my view. I feel much better about my decision. Thank you, everybody. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Oh, this is a good one. I can't wait to see what our listeners have to say about it. Old man teaches me a lesson in common sense. I work at a dollar store that also happens to be the only grocery store in my small rural town. Most of our customers are regulars who live nearby, and I have a friendly relationship with many of them. About a month ago, our managers called a staff meeting and explained that we had to start getting stricter about carding people for tobacco. We have to ask to see a physical ID every time we sell these products, even if the person is a regular who comes in every day and is clearly elderly. We also have to see the IDs of every person in the shopping party who looks to be older than 15, meaning parents can't buy these products with their older teenage kids in tow. I think the rule is stupid, but I follow it because my managers emphasized how important it was and how we could lose our jobs if we didn't. I usually tell parents with teenage kids that they can finish their transaction, go put their groceries and kids in the car, and come back inside to buy cigarettes. Most people are annoyed about this, but accept it. The other day, I got two older men I'd never seen before come in to buy snacks. One of them wanted cigarettes. As per policy, I asked to see both of their IDs. They argued with me for a bit about it because the guy who wasn't buying them didn't have his, and they were both clearly over 60. We've got old man one who wants the cigarettes and has his ID, and we've got old man two, the man who doesn't have an ID, and we've got me. Old man one. I don't understand why you're being like this. I can't accept that you're too dumb to tell that I'm over 21. Me. I know, right? I can't believe they're making me enforce such a pointless rule. Trust me, I'd love to sell you your cigarettes, but I don't want to risk my job, and they've been tough on us lately. Old man one. Well, I ain't leaving without my cigarettes. Me. It's not in my power to make that call. Let me get you my manager to speak to. Yeah, get me your manager. Maybe he'll have some common sense. So I get my store manager and explain the situation. He tries to explain the policy to the guys, but they keep escalating it and they're starting to yell. So he backtracks and tells me to just give them the cigarettes. At this point, I was kind of relieved because I thought it would shut them up. I was wrong. Me, scanning the cigs. I'm sorry about all that, sir. No, you're not. Don't act like you're sorry. You're just mad the manager wouldn't let you get away with it. Me, at this point, I'm just in customer service robot mode. I'm glad you got your cigarettes. I hope you found everything else you need today. How old 
old are you? How old are you? Me. I'm 23. I'm old enough to be your grandfather, and you could see that for yourself if you just open your darn eyes and have some common sense. Do you even know what that means? I come from a generation where a thing called common sense ran the world, but I don't think young people even know what that means anymore. Old man too. Be careful. You're going to offend him. Young people get so offended when you talk about common sense. They both had a good laugh about that, and I forced a smile, and very politely bagged their items and wished them a nice day, and then locked myself in the bathroom to practice breathing exercises until I no longer had the urge to jump over the counter and fight an old man. The sad thing is, I would have just suggested that the guy with the ID get back in line without his friend to buy them if he hadn't been so rude to me. What do you think about this store policy? Do you think it makes sense, or is it kind of dumb? Please let us know. I hope he shouted OK Boomer as they left. I know I would have. My boss Karen didn't listen to me and makes a $10,000 mistake. So I work at an outdoor bar and grill. I work as a busboy but have some responsibilities outside of that. One of these responsibilities is stocking the walk-in freezer when beer shipments come in. The restaurant that I work at is very popular in my town, which means it takes a very long time to stock the mammoth shipments they take most of the day. 100 to 200 cases of beer. So I got to work on a shipment day and there's more than I thought. I'm taking a lot longer than I usually would. I look up at the sky and the clouds are looking pretty rough. I look at my phone and lo and behold, it's gonna thunderstorm. So I take the hand truck and start moving the beer under a canopy. My boss sees this and doesn't like that I'm taking another 30 minutes to move the beer for a second time. She was a police officer for 20 years and as she puts it, I always know best. So she just starts chucking the beer in the freezer way too high with no regard for how it's stacked. I know she's going to mess up royally and try and explain that that's not how you do it. This is how the following conversation ensued. My memory isn't the best, so this is a generalization. Me. That's not how you do it. You're stacking them the wrong way and the towers are way too high. Boss. I've been in this game for three years. I know what I'm doing. Me. You put me here to do this job and to do it right, and I was trained properly. That's the wrong way to do it. Boss, either help me or the door's that way. Points at door. Cue malicious compliance. So I go home for the day because I know it's going to go wrong and I don't want to be responsible. Not 30 minutes later, I get a call from a coworker furiously screaming at me, saying that I need to get back and fix my mistake. So I ride my bike back and walk right to the freezer and see a mess. The entire right wall fell down, ruining around $4,000 worth of beer, $2,000 worth of food, and the entire wall is soaked. They had to close down the restaurant for two weeks to fix the freezer from the damage. Beer got under the floor and started messing up the walls and floor. Moral of the story, listen to your employees. Update. My boss tried to lie to upper management to get me fired, saying that I was the one that told her how to stack the beer. Thank God my coworker Jack saw what happened and vouched for me. She got fired. Feelsgoodman.jpg Have you ever had a boss who didn't know what they were doing? If so, what happened as a result of that? Please let us know. I always know what I'm doing. Am I the jerk for calling out my sister's fiance when I recognized the engagement ring he proposed with was fake? This is an ongoing mess that continues to haunt me. I'm a 22-year-old female, and my 25-year-old sister Hannah is newly engaged to her boyfriend of many years, Ben, who's 25. Ben and Hannah are high school sweethearts. He's the only boyfriend she's ever had, so she tends to take his word as the gospel truth. But I've always been suspicious of Ben, as I tend to be of all people, to be fair. Hannah and I have very different worldviews. I've had quite a few boyfriends and one girlfriend. I believe in freedom and exploring yourself. Hannah only knows Ben. Anyway, we had a small gathering of family around at my sister's house for a barbecue in the garden. During the barbecue, Ben got down on one knee and proposed. At first, I was super excited for them, but then I saw the ring. And I'd seen this ring before. Call it divine intervention, but I'd seen this ring a few months back on Etsy. Hannah had hinted that her and Ben were discussing tying the knot, and we discussed rings at length. I went online to search for the type of rings she said she was interested in and happened across a very unique and pretty ring on Etsy, but it had a fake middle stone, i.e. lab-created diamond set between two tiny opal-colored stones. 
The band was really dainty, but kind of intertwined around in a teeny rope. So as soon as I saw the ring, I recognized it. The going rule for engagement rings, as everyone knows, is that they are supposed to last forever and be at least three to four months pay. Ben works a good paying job, but brings in slightly less than Hannah. Four months wages for him would be at least eight to $10,000 at an estimate. I know for a fact, this particular ring is $450. I waited until the proposal was over and asked Ben and Hannah for a quiet word, but this has the opposite effect as I was overheard by other family, so I decided to just come out with it. I told Hannah that I had seen her ring online and that it wasn't a real diamond or even expensive. I accused Ben of trying to cheap out on one of the most important gifts of her entire life, and this was a huge mistake. Hannah burst into tears and informed me that she had given Ben a maximum budget of $400 and that she didn't want a real diamond. I was completely shocked that she would request this and was pretty certain she was just covering for Ben, but she doubled down and said that she has, so far, lost every single piece of jewelry she's bought and that she wanted to buy something that won't be a devastating loss if she loses it. She also claimed that they both wanted a long and expensive honeymoon instead of a big wedding. By this point, Hannah was crying loudly and I decided I best leave. I thought I was doing my sister a sisterly duty by pointing out the fake ring, and my entire family have in turn called me a jerk. But I honestly think I was just trying to help her. Am I the jerk? So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh shut up Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, <laughs> re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true. Most, most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen what to record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below. Never! And join as a channel member today, and Karen will give you a special shout-out in the next video. Like heck I will!